Welcome to the Heretic's Guide to Gemstone, my historical exploration series for the massively multiplayer text-based game Gemstone 3. I'm your host, the player Zorus. This is the third episode of my series exploring the Broken Lance and its surrounding areas. In this episode, I will focus on the possible hidden meanings of the Broken Land. This is what could be called subtext as opposed to exploring its context. It is taking much wider swings at guessing the higher concept. Much more speculative, but quite possibly right. The second episode interpreted the Broken Land and its documents in the context of the Shadowworld setting and Rollmaster source books. This was highly conservative in a sense because we know the story was set in that context. It was more a matter of figuring out what parts of that world setting were intended to be relevant, where the Broken Land is deviating from canon, what it all means. But that is not the only kind of implicit meaning. There may be references to other sources, such as real-world history, or other works of fiction unrelated to Shadow World. This can form a parallel or allegory to some other set of ideas that informs the higher concept. In the fifth episode of my Graveyard series, for example, I argue that it was subtly involving some real-world dead gods of the underworld mythology which will sound familiar if you have watched the second episode of this series on the Broken Lands. There was also a fairly overt parallel to Dante's Inferno, which is itself a religious allegory, as well as an argument that the graveyard was symbolizing Gemstone's old death mechanics, and that these were both in turn based on a few H.P. Lovecraft stories. So, in the second episode, I showed why the Broken Lands story, for various reasons, should be related to the graveyard story because of the world setting. Uthex Cathiasis and Banter Etrevion should have known each other. They would have been in the same place in the same historical period. The portal to the Broken Land would have been in the territory of Banter's theocracy in Amish Dampers Kadena, because what Kygar treated as the southern end of the Seelfar Strake still has the bay to the north, which means it has to be near the southern mountains on the windward edge of the high plateau which is all a matter of world setting context, implicit but unavoidable. It is fundamentally weird that there is a theocracy to Empress Kadena during the Wars of Dominion. Empress Kadena is supposed to be long dead, and it is treating her like a dead goddess, and I argue that the Dark Shrine in the Broken Land treats her that way as well. So that was context, world setting stuff, internal logic. In this episode, I will show that the two stories are also deeply related in terms of what I think are the subtexts of the graveyard. That is remarkable because Kygar was not a GM yet when those parts of the game were built. That was only a year or two off, so its creators were probably still on staff. These subtexts will include parallels to certain HP Lovecraft stories, some literal use of real-world historical religious architecture, the motif of a dark mirror or everything is backwards, time paradoxes, and symbolism with the death mechanics. There will be a set of aspects that are esoteric and mystical, yet another set that are material and rational. Before I get into the guts of it, I want to talk a little about method, which I eschewed in episode 2 but should address here. In the second episode of my Graveyard series, I talked a bunch about methodology and narrative interpretation, how the authorial intent is not uniquely determined by what is written. It's only one of some number of consistent possibilities. You might be able to reconstruct the intent to some extent, but you have to guess it from a framework of subjective probabilities. Moreover, even if you get part of the original intent basically right, you can overfit the data by trying to explain more than was intended to be explained by that part. That is, by reading too much into things, so to speak, even if it's supposed to be read into. In the case of the Broken Land, we are fortunate in that we have an actual, though partial, statement of the authorial intent. We know that the theme was the relationship between the Dark Gods and the Unlife during the Wars of Dominion. But that by itself is not sufficient it would not motivate any of the irreric in the Broken Land. That is apparently about the relationship of Empress Kadena and the Dark Gods, which is an ill-defined, mostly undefined point in Shadow World, and ought to vastly predate the Wars of Dominion. It might also be about the relationship of Kadena's surviving followers, servants of the Unlife in the Wars of Dominion, 
with the Dark Gods, whatever the more ancient relationship might have been with the Lords of Essence. Lord Gallus has some relationship with Chrysis, for example, in the Emer book from 1990, in a section of text about Kadena's headless body being near the South Pole. is in a sarcophagus, not the fake one next to the Black Hell portal, though the final disposition of Kadena's body is treated inconsistently in Shadow World. The same book has her falling through the Black Gates of the Void. The later text has her body instantly disintegrating, so there's no real canon on that subject. Gemstone 3 was an adaptation of the Shadow World setting, so it can do its own thing, as well as explore unexplained plot points of Shadow World. Moreover, the creator encouraged readers to look beyond the surface to figure out the reason behind it all. So we have a kind of basic question. What is canon? Canon are only those things that are explicitly stated in the source material, strictly speaking. It could be stretched to include supplementary documentation and author statements. You have to stretch the definition to include, say, the script of the movie. Because the film is an adaptation of the script, they make changes to it. But anything that is an interpretation of the material is not canon. Anything implied, even if it's the point, is not canon. An excuse made for a plot hole is not canon. Interpretations, the theories fans come up with for explaining plot elements, are sometimes called fanon. Ironically, the authorial intent itself, if not explicitly stated, is not canon. If you go full postmodernist, then it still wouldn't be canon. Even if you accept such word of God, it might have limits. One might argue it is only the authorial intent at the time of creation that counts, or at least the final intent upon finishing since writing is messy. Concepts evolve during writing, and authors may not even remember what they had in mind when they first wrote that part. What authors assert outside the text, after the fact, becomes increasingly dubious, trying to rule what things meant, especially revisions of what they mean. Why would it matter what they say if they change their mind? From the vantage of what was actually established at the time of the earlier source material, even later canon developments, from a strict enough point of view, might as well be regarded as being separate continuities. Stuff that was not planned yet when the original was made. Or even planned things which were never developed. Think of orphan story arcs or plot hooks, stuff GMs or former GMs had intended to do, but never actually established. Later developments certainly have no authority over adaptations based on the earlier works such as the case of early gemstone with later ice books, which is why I'm carefully separating those out. Often it might be the case that the author did not consider the issues under question, or was going to address it later, or it was never meant to be elaborated. The Tahir were such a thing, players went to town with it, an example of so-called fanfic fuel. And after all, this is an immersive fantasy RPG, like if a D&D &D group kept running even when their DM isn't around. Players making up their own individual fanon is kind of the whole point of it. Sometimes it gets canonized to one extent or another later. Then there are inconsistencies. When you do a close reading of something, you are likely to encounter continuity errors or internal inconsistencies. In the case of a movie, for example, it is difficult to avoid, involving multiple shots and moving parts. But what if the narrative has framing for the mistake to possibly be intentional or meaningful? Was it a miracle when Jules and Vincent did not get hit by bullets in Pulp Fiction? The bullet holes were already there in the green wall behind them, when the guy burst out of the bathroom and fired at them. But the holes were not there earlier in the movie. Some people say that's just a set mistake or continuity error. Other people say it's the divine intervention. Similarly, Jules' 9mm is visibly out of bullets after shooting Brett. The identical time and angle later in the movie, though, they did not use the same footage of Jules. Now his gun is no longer empty. Is this another continuity error, or did God reload the gun with divine intervention, as per the narrative framework? When you go to the script for Pulp Fiction, it says they empty their guns into Brett in capital letters. Then when the Seinfeld-looking guy comes out of the bathroom shooting at them, the script has Jules and Vincent shooting him anyway. It's difficult to count the shots exactly, but Vincent was probably out of bullets too, 
which means when they were having their theological discussion in the car, Vincent's forty five was out of bullets when he shot Marvin in the face. The characters never questioned it because they did not notice. But again, scripts themselves are not really canon. Marvin got shot under the throat in the script. So the author might blow off a plot hole by saying a wizard did it. Or they might shrug off a theory or say, sure, why not? They might even say, I wish I had come up with that, or turn around and use it themselves as ascended fanon. Gemstone is a multi author continuity, so often fanon becomes canon later when players become GMs. This might even lead to a popular misinterpretation replacing the original intent. The broken land being treated as the moon would be a good example if its backstory was reliable narration because it states the broken land is supposed to be another plane of existence. But because Gemstone 3 was an adaptation of Shadow World, what was made for Gemstone is not canonical for Shadow World. But the Shadow World books, strictly speaking, are not canonical for Gemstone 3. They are what might be called Deuterocanon. Their source text would show lots of stuff not stated within Gemstone or its own unique canonical documentation. They are something resembling official, but reasonable people can dispute which parts of it have authority. The Catholics might say Demons of the Burning Night counts, and the Protestants say it doesn't. Maybe some bit in it might count, but for the most part it's irrelevant. Only the Master Atlas and the Kelborn module count, the King James version of the Master Atlas. First edition only, heretics. They agree on those books being canon, so the disputed books are deuterocanon. I'm speaking loosely, of course, because Gemstone is its own thing. Only the excerpts put in our tombs of Colthea would be canon. The source books themselves would still be deuterocanon. The script of Pulp Fiction is its deuterocanon. So when something like The Broken Land goes off canon from the deuterocanon of these other source books, there's the plot holes in the deuterocanon itself, as well as adaptation induced plot holes. You have to figure out which parts of those sources still count as correct. If Empress Kadena in Gemstone is really a fallen Lord of Ohan who turned to follow the ways of the unlife, for example, Master Atlas becomes wrong about the Lords of Ohan not being Lords of Essence from the First Era, even though that is something that is stated in explicit and unambiguous terms. It is even harder when you don't know which books should be excluded. The 1990 and 1992 rules on Dark Gods and Portals are not identical. Which of those is relevant for the Broken Land portal? By the 1992 rules, Morgu probably can't use it. The 1990 book was clearly used, at least. Maybe he avoids it because it's wet. <laughs> and then there's just a massive amount of stuff in general. Some detail ought to be relevant, but it might have been missed or otherwise ignored or retconned by the adaptation. And a lot of it is just not relevant to anything at all. Most of the Shadow World setting is not relevant to Gemstone, and one of the criticisms that world setting often gets is that it's often the tabletop equivalent of a closet play, which is a play written only to be read. Plays indulging in their own story, not designed for actual production on a stage. It's telling a very high level story, involving a scale of powers and volume of knowledge that are too high for a 20 level dice game. And so a lot of it is more like background for background's sake, and there's a huge learning curve on the background, while at the same time there are a bunch of adventure modules that have minimal connection to that background. The Kelborn adventure module is low level and relatively disconnected from all that, which made that campaign setting relatively playable in actual gameplay. That is the actual setting of Gemstone 3. Which then invites the question, when you have an adaptation, how consistent it is with the total world setting. Because it can have intentional inconsistencies, but it can also be unintentionally inconsistent, which is important when the differences are what convey what is trying to be said. Like we see in The Broken Land, which deviates from official RM materials. Gemstone has never had a uniform level of seriousness or presumption of immersion or world logic. One part of the game might be serious and deep, while another part it will be ridiculous. But what about when there's other stuff that might be relevant? stuff that's not even deuterocanon. Say some guy makes some YouTube videos arguing there are parallels to Dante and Lovecraft in old gemstone areas. He might have a lot of supporting arguments. 
maybe sound very convincing, but it's not supported by any statement from the creators. There's no word of God for it, not even a word of St. Paul, someone who knew the creators. This word of Dante might have a lot of validity, but it is still constructing an interpretation, which is its own edifice. Which is so much to say that I am building theories which will likely include unintended interpretations. I'm trying to get it as right as possible, but some of it will have been unintentional. The intent is allegory, you might say. The coincidences are only applicability. That's a distinction I'm ripping off from Tolkien, who insisted he wasn't writing an allegory. But how hard can you scratch it without reading too much into it? There are solid grounds for thinking the Broken Land was meant to stand up to a lot of scrutiny on its internal consistency. When you look at how conceptually dense the added historical and language background was to the era of glossary, or the attention in the room painting to when things seemed natural, artificial, or abnormal, in all the source materials referenced, there's a lot there for analysis. There's a lot of concept to be taken seriously, not least of which because the creator explicitly said to look beyond the surface that there is reason and purpose behind it all, that it is meant to all make sense, and to dig into the background material to figure out its full meaning. So what I'm constructing gives a lot of depth of meaning, possibly revealing intended meaning. But what I'm doing is fallible, and might at times be more like Dante's allegory, where all that stuff about circles of hell, poetic punishments, the mountain of purgatory, and so on, are not actually in the Bible. I'm giving mutually exclusive possibilities for some things as well, so at least some of them will not be what was intended. Our ability to falsify these theories is limited, but one way of vetting between alternatives is to come up with other perspectives, trying to find the ones that work best. When you find the right framework, it can suddenly explain a lot. There's also an illusion that happens where, though the number of premises in something may actually be relatively small, Trying to interpret and vet and motivate them makes it all sound deeper and more complex than it really is. When you already know the recipe of something, it's a lot simpler than figuring out what may be in it. But we would be content with rightly guessing that those ingredients even exist. And you can overfit the data by trying to explain too much, from taking a premise and interpreting details with it. In the cases where my conjectures and theories are only coincidental, it will just be... Gosh, wouldn't it be cool if that had been right? The heavy bulk of this episode will be the Lovecraft stories and the relationship with the death religion of Gemsum 3. But not everything reduces to Shadow World and Lovecraft. There's some other stuff involved. One part of the whole design that does not have a clear inspiration from some other work of fiction is the monastery. As you'll see, I think I can explain the cave itself with Lovecraft, but not the monastery. You can find an evil monastery, or a priory, but not one that looks this way. I've looked around without much to show for it. The closest thing I've seen is The Colossus of Elorn, a story by Clark Ashton Smith, who is one of the Lovecraft Circle writers. This story has solid odds, I think, of being a source of inspiration for Bone Spear Tower. It's about a dwarf necromancer who makes a colossus out of dead bodies. I would bet that tower was also inspired by the Ghostbusters movies, though I'm not going to get into that in this series. <laughs> but there's a small Cistercian monastery across the valley on the opposite cliff from the evil castle of Ylorn, where the monks witness a procession of liches across the valley toward those runes. One of the monks accidentally breaks his neck, drunkenly falling off a precipice, so they laid him in the monastery chapel and prayed for his soul but he turned into one of the liches and ran off. And you can draw various potential minor inspirations. The monastery has an abbot, the story has familiars, but it's all very thin, nothing so direct as monks guarding a portal to another world, but potentially an inspiration for using Will Master's monastic liches. Lich, lick, like, like, lichen, however you pronounce that word. So... Without being able to figure out the monastery with a frontal approach, I think more progress can be made by approaching it laterally. In the Graveyard series, I found that the key to much of the allegory was to take the architecture in it literally. 
meaning there are three distinct concept areas representing real-world historical architectures. One part of the graveyard is a mockery of a medieval manor like you would find in England. Another part is a passage barrel mound crossed with a Viking ship burial. And another part is an Egyptian mastaba or mortuary temple, except with cyclopean masonry instead of mud brick. They are not just vaguely reminiscent of these real-world cultural markers as flavoring. They have specific details about them that appear to be historically informed. What if it really is that is the allegorical interpretation. This in turn was pointing to a common theme of dead or fallen god of the underworld in various mythologies. Osiris with the Egyptian, hell with the Viking, Satan with the medieval Europe. Satan because of an apparent parallel with Dante's Inferno and being hell's monarch in it. Hades with the Cyclopean masonry because that is Mycenaean from Tyrants so-called because the myth was the blocks are so heavy they must have been moved by Cyclops, which is ridiculous. We now know it was aliens who could have been Cyclops. It was probably on the History Channel. But the term Cyclopean masonry comes from Tyrants. I think the labors of Heracles or Hercules, whether you prefer Greek or Roman, traveling down into the underworld and wrestling Cerberus. He was traveling back and forth from Tyrants. That was also a candidate explanation for the name of the deed priestess in the landing temple, Tyrian, Bithronian, Ubal. So there were specific architectural details like the false door in the crypt with its Egyptian style offering formula to Kadena, which went beyond being generic. They were historically informed and self-consciously symbolic. And these were actually hybrid concepts, often with details that are exactly backwards. There would be very subtle plays on words or remarkably specific terminology, like hogsheads for the wine casks in Kestrel's burial mount, which is also much to say, let's try to understand the monastery with the same approach, not as representing a specific historical or fictional place, but instead as a kind of place from history. The monastic liches, I would posit, are also a hybrid concept. They are a cross between the ideas of Western monks and Eastern monks. The Western style monk of a Christian monastery, for example, is fairly straightforward. There's a chapel, an abbot, monastic cells, that kind of thing. The abbot has a solitary meditation room for reading, which is how they do in those monasteries. Lectio Divina, divine reading. But the monks there also venerate K, essentially the martial arts god, and they summon Kilin through rifts to defend themselves. Kilin are an Eastern mythological beast, the Buddhist version that has them breathing fire, and ours casts boil earth. Their dragon's head notably comes directly from mythology. That detail is not in the Rollmaster version. The monks do not actually do unarmed combat mechanically, but that's their Rollmaster class. The Volum Fu mechanics, for example, were a few years later. Unarmed combat, as we know it now, was even later. The top level meditation room is communal with a meditation symbol for monks to meditate on together, which is a lot more like Tibetan monks or Hindu yogi than, say, the medieval Cistercian monks. So we can look at the monastery itself a little more closely through these lenses, that it is a hybrid of Western and Eastern monastery concepts. First, right off the bat, historical usage. Monks are monastics residing in monasteries. Friars are mendicants wandering around in poverty. The placid monk that wandered around town and his buddies in the Landing Temple are bad monks. They're supposed to be hanging out in isolation in the Shaljin Temple, which is on the opposite side of the bay, west of the Seelfar Strait. But monasticism is ascetic, as are mendicants. It involves renouncing worldly pursuits for the spiritual. There are different forms of it. Hermits, for example, live in isolation. Cenobites live a communal life with each other under an abbot. That's what the word actually means out of Greek, communal life. There are some variations between these extremes. Anchorites are similar to hermits, except they have to stay in the same place, in cells attached to their churches. There's also a consecration involved akin to funeral rites, where the monks become dead to the world. It was supposedly a common practice of medieval Cistercian monks 
to meditate on death upon waking by picturing their reanimated bodies rising from the grave at the resurrection. They would also meditate in bed about never waking up again before falling asleep. There were also judgment meditations on falling short of immortality standards. This kind of spiritual discipline in general is called the mortification of the flesh, spiritually and perhaps physically, such as with fasting or self-flagellation, which is an interesting point and at least worth noting for our liches who happen to have gaping holes in their chests. Whereas in Buddhism, you have notions of enlightenment and your consciousness transcending your physical body. It is unclear to what extent our monks were eremitic or cenobitic, because they might have mostly stayed in their own cells. Cenobites tend to house multiple monks per room, and that is apparently not the case here. Each cell has only one cot. But regardless, these cloisters or enclosed religious orders separate the monks from the external world. They do not own any personal property. The works of their trades are all owned communally, which we see in the contrast between the gallery and the monastic cells. I floated the possibility in the first episode that this represents the corruption of worldly possessions, but that's likely not the intent. It's more likely just community-owned craftsmanship. The diversity of works in the gallery reflects monks of different trades. There's still something to that, though, because the concentration of church property and wealth in this way is what provoked the itinerant mendicant poverty approach instead, historically speaking, I mean, in medieval Europe. There's also something to that in how much more posh the abbot's living circumstances were compared to the monks. Medieval abbots might not even wear the habits at all and could border on being secular feudal lords. So the abbot has his own wing of the monastery with multiple rooms. His digs are tricked out, comparatively speaking at least. The others were much more spartan. So that is basically the concept we see represented with the monks of the monastery. And per the rule of St. Benedict, such monastics are to live autonomously. So we see the monastery as very much a self-contained environment, though they would need to be going outside for food, unless they were eating, say, manna bread from casting spells, though it isn't clear if that's a valid possibility. That spell existed on paper by at least April 1993, but that spell list, what we now call Major Spirit, was mostly not implemented yet. The question is whether it was listed there in mid-1992, but either way, the monks had internal access to fresh water. Similarly, the old herb mastery spell, which was slot 217, it would magically spawn edible healing foods, though the original wording for it, interestingly, was about preparing plants in order to bring out their natural healing properties, which is interesting, contrasting it with the unskilled because it implies the healing properties are not automatically given. So in a world setting sense, the extreme healing of those herbs is more rarefied than we would naively think. It sounds like you forage an herb and it may not do anything, or it poisons you instead of healing you. And level 17 is a very high level spell in that time period. Who knows what the original intent was mechanically. That also might just be vestigial language from Rule Master Spell Law, where herb mastery spells are only about increasing the potency of herbs. And there's actually rules about it, that the plant growth spells, which are a different list, cannot be used for growing herbs. This is actually likely because in straight Merle Master, herbs can be hazardous, which makes a lot more sense than the gemstone context. Though monks in spell law are mentalists, so they wouldn't have those spells anyway. But that's just an aside. The point is that it's unclear if these food spells were listed yet in Gemstone when the monastery was built. They certainly cooked food inside the monastery. You can see the kitchen area where they did it. Calborn is actually useless for agriculture because of the irregular seasons. It's very cold up there in the ice source book for the region, which is why the water to the monastery is so cold that it inflicts damage. So the monks would have to eat by foraging or acquiring meat. What about the monastery itself? its architectural elements. The first thing I would like to draw attention to is the atrium. The room inside the doorway is called the atrium, which if you stop to think about it, is actually very weird. An atrium is a wide open space going up multiple stories with a skylight or even open air. 
the atrium in the monastery is inside a cave, and not at all described that way. In fact, it's pretty explicitly defined to the contrary. It's backwards from what a modern atrium should be. But the atrium in the context of a Christian church or monastery is the entryway. It would be what serves as the forecourt in early Christian basilicas. Granted, an open-aired courtyard, but essentially the entry hall. This is because early Christian monastic cloisters were based on the peristyle court design of ancient Roman domus domiciles. So in Roman doma, you have the vestibule entrance leading into the atrium, where there's a shallow pool of water. Except in the monastery here, this is all underground with underground water, instead of water pooled off the roof with an underground cistern. And the monastery pool of water is outside the vestibule, formed instead by the mountain's waterfall. So we have some clear parallels in the concept, but some details are backwards. This will be a familiar theme. It exists in other old areas. There would then be lavish furnishings around the atrium, including a bust of the master of the house or some other big shot family member, and a statue to the gods or ancestral spirits. The Romans often made statues out of bronze, and we see all of these things in the gallery. These become typical and expected objects when put in the Roman context. There would also be a lararium, a shrine to the household gods, which stored items symbolizing family change and coming-of-age events. This could explain what the shadow box in the gallery is about. Those are often used to store life event objects. For example, if you have a military shadow box, it would have things in it like the medals you were awarded. That might also more specifically explain the tapestry of the great moon of the Lords of Orhan though the elegant oil painting of the landscape in the Wars of Dominion is not Roman. The earliest oil paintings were made by Buddhists in Afghanistan, murals inside rooms carved from the rock along the Silk Road. The gallery itself might be a play on words. You want to think of it as an art gallery, but that is the modern usage of gallery that arose historically. Galleries in architecture are covered entry passages. They would often be used to exhibit art, the term gallery is used for balconies or promenades as well, such as in a theater or church, but which also may be facing out into courtyards. In other words, facing out into the atrium, and the monastery's huge doorway also has an overhang supported by six massive columns. The word does not appear explicitly, but that is a portico, where technically both the platform and interior could be considered galleries. So you arguably have the term gallery being used in up to several different senses of the word. And the term atrium is used in at least a couple of different senses of the word. There is a Roman sense and a Christian monastery sense, even though it contradicts the modern sense. Wealthy households of Rome would also have a marble cartabulum in the atrium, usually next to the impluvium, the pool of water, where the cartabulum is a long table made of stone whose supports are carved to resemble mythological creatures, which we see in the atrium room next to the gallery in the monastery. In the monastery, the cartibulum is made to depict wild horses. It is very difficult to shake that off as a coincidence. I will talk more about the wild horses if I do one of these series on Shadow Valley. I think they are supposed to be mythological water spirits, such as Kelpies. Actually, I think Vedic religion is relevant to Shadow Valley as well. Silver Valley should have been somewhere up in the Seal of our Strake, though the monastery predates that story by a few years. But the use of the word atrium here in the monastery only makes sense if it is interpreted in terms of the historical usage of that word. This might even motivate the use of floor mosaics in the monastery as that was common in Roman architecture, though that is a stretch. Mosaics could be influenced from any number of directions. But regardless, it is real-world history that makes sense of it, not the shadow world history. It is allegorical. We might regard the monastery sewer and bath in the same way as something akin to the ancient Roman sanitation system, where there would be a central runoff into a nearby stream, which is an underground river for the monastery. Their water system is made to take advantage of the water flow down and through the mountain, which is overall a really cool concept that does not really get appreciated. People just kind of ignore it as a door puzzle to get around, but it is not necessarily supposed to be Roman. At the end of this episode, I will look more closely at the mechanism for swinging the huge stone door open and shut.
but it would be reasonable to guess there is hydraulic power involved with its gears, probably in the form of a water wheel driven in some way by their plumbing, since they have a waterfall forming an underground river. I mention this because the Cistercian monks, who are essentially Benedictine monks but even more strict, use hydraulics in their remote medieval monasteries. The Rueda Abbey in Spain, for example, is named for its water wheel and used a series of aqueducts for their indoor plumbing. The Sato Abbey had a communal necessarium, a latrine, adjacent to the dormitory of the monks, which was designed to be washed away by a stream and not pollute the other water, which our monastery has in its privy room, which is also its lavatorium. You could come up with other potential historical inspirations. The Monastery of Piedra in Spain is relatively fortified against Muslims. That has water wheels. The Abbey of St. Romain in France is older and Benedictine, but it's a cave monastery in a small limestone mountain. So, who knows? But Cistercians used water wheels as hydraulics. These waterworks were also a method of central heating, which it is implicitly in our monastery, since the water is heated by a hot spring. So this may all very well be inspired by the historical Cistercian monasteries. The monastery also has a system of floodgates to keep water from flowing back into the monastery sewer. This is the puzzle the familiars go through to get the rocks for the door mechanism, which is interesting. It is essentially a megalithic door lock. The floodgates have their own pulley mechanisms. By the way, this screen capture here is fascinating. The iron door in the sewer at some point became bugged on one side of it. Instead of saying iron door like it should, it is giving a whole room description. Well, more specifically, it says iron door when it is closed, but has this apparent bug when it is opened. But this room is from some cryptic tower that does not seem connected to the game. It has seemingly nothing to do with the monastery or the sewer. Unless it's some aberrant portal that was meant to be a weird eldritch vista which is not totally impossible, but it looks like a bug. There used to be sewer rat snakes that would wander around in the monastery sewer. I've never seen one down there, at least as an actual spawned creature. Though a rat snake does still appear as a one-off messaging, when it steals all of the rocks from the basket, which makes the huge door swing shut again. It takes four rocks to open the door. But... Much more subtly, you have this drain in the room before the iron door, which describes the basin of a sacrificial altar. This is intriguing because there's nothing on the top level indicating the burned altar has such a thing, though the sewers also refer to gratings that do not get mentioned in the rooms above it. You want to think bloody sacrifices, and who knows if it was something more pagan, but this should be older than the desecration of the altar. So this is probably referring to a sacrarium, which in Catholic churches are drains for disposing of holy materials. It's actually specifically not supposed to go into the sewer. It's supposed to go directly into the earth. So this is actually exactly backwards and would be blasphemous. If you knowingly wrongly dispose of consecrated wine or bread, you are automatically ex excommunicated in Catholicism. So I would point out that the monks desecrated their own altar burning their chapel. They did not trash anything else in the monastery, only the chapel. But if the chapel is supposed to be that historically informed, then this large chest is presumably a tabernacle in the Catholic sense of the word. And the brazier next to it, which opens the hidden stairway, would be the vigil lamp that goes next to the altar. The rail of rare black windac would be an altar rail where you kneel for communion. That's actually important because it clearly indicates the Eucharist concept. It is separating the chancel from the sanctuary space with the altar. That would all be very subtle, but plausible given the atrium. The sacrifice altar isn't necessarily Christian. You could interpret it as, say, Jewish. But there doesn't seem to be much of anything to point in that direction. For now, my best guess is that the drain is meant to be a sacrarium, even though Shadowworld has no Eucharist concept which I will get into more later. Then you have the monastic cells, where cells is the historical term for monk living quarters. That's much lower hanging fruit, like the monastery having an abbot, which has no basis in anything from Shadow World. The monastery, therefore, is an abbey. Oh, by the way, I had highlighted the 14 monks in the room painting for the refectory, 
but noted there appeared to only be 13 residents, at least from the beds present in the monastery now. There is the abbot, and then there are 12 single cot monastic cells. This number is not arbitrary. It is historical for Catholicism. Abbots are the superior to no fewer than 12 monks. This is the smallest allowable monastery. What about Eastern monasteries? Buddhism has abbots too, but that's an English word. The word is different in other languages. But then there's the monasteries. When you look at the vestibule and the atrium, it makes it very clear this is carved out, that it is supposed to be rock-cut architecture. You see this in various places, like the Jordanian city of Petra, familiar from Indiana Jones' Last Crusade. The rock-cut architecture was really big, though, was in India with Buddhism and other religions. India has tons of rock-cut architecture and is mostly religious. Sacred caves would be turned into temples or monasteries. These would often be artificial caves, grottos. Grottos were also popular in Rome. The cave monasteries from early Buddhism had vihara, monastic cells laid out in a rectangular pattern. When you look at this, you realize the monastery cells are not actually on diagonals. This is really just describing three cells next to each other on each wall. It's a straight hallway with doors lining the east and west walls. So really, it's actually six doors on each wall heading north and south. Now that this proves it is vihara, there's just no peristyle court in it. Individual cells along a long corridor was done by the Carthusians, who are a blend of Aramaic and Cenobitic monasticism. Ordained choir monks will stay inside their cells. Lay monks give them food through compartments. But Carthusians have priors, not abbots. This hallway is made of ill-fitted rock, though, which is curious. It's not even rock-cut carving. It's all just pieced together. It implies they put less effort into their private areas, but a lot of effort into the common areas. If you look closely at the room painting of these areas in general, you will notice a lot of explicit mention of the rock surfaces, whether they are abrasive or polished, carved or seemingly natural. It is indicating clearly that these are details meant to be taken seriously. So I will look into that aspect of things more closely later. Because he doesn't just talk about surfaces being polished in these room description. It will also mention things like abrasive cloths being used for stone polishing. So the way things come into being, processes are being made relevant. We will want to know if things were made different ways. Something I would draw attention to is this archway that is described as looking incongruously like the mouth of a giant carp. It has a very distinctive shape and it is found in Buddhist religious architecture called Chaityas. I might be mispronouncing that, but anyway. The most famous is the earliest one of all, the Lomas Rishi Cave in Northeast India. Rishi is essentially the word for sage in the Vedic religions and can even refer to Buddhist monks. Kilin, by the way, are said to appear with the births and deaths of sages, which may be relevant. This cave was actually not Buddhist. It was made for a rival set called Ajavikas. They rejected karma, the Vedas, and believed in predetermination. But this became the basis of Chaityas in Buddhist temples. It does look like the mouth of a giant carp. Then, as I mentioned in the first episode, the meditation room has a lapis lazuli triangle with an ornate geometric pattern around it. Lapis lazuli is also used in the monastery's gallery, and that stands out because that was especially rare in medieval times. It was used in Christian monasteries for blue dye, which was very expensive in those days. Lapis lazuli came from Afghanistan, imported from the Silk Road, like the Buddhist caves with oil paintings that I mentioned. We would only use the blue dye for something important, like making representations of the Virgin Mary in illuminated manuscripts. But the triangle with the geometric pattern around it is almost certainly supposed to be a chakra, which is fascinating. The chakras are meditation symbols. But they are also part of Hindu esotericism, tantric yoga, meditation philosophy. When I get into the Lovecraft section, this is going to turn out to be important. The chakras are associated with spots up and down the body. People have a physical body and a spirit body. So while I argued in the second episode that the monastic lich description with the gaping holes in their chests might be referring to the ritual of Black Eternity from the 1995 Rollmaster books, 
it could also mean something else. These monks ripping their chests open. Because one of the triangle chakras is at that point of the body, especially if they had that description before 1995. The described burp was late 1992 or early 1993. The New Age version of the chakras, by the way, associates each chakra with one of the Newtonian colors, which is interesting because the Miklian correspond to that color spectrum as well. With the exception of indigo, of course, it skips from blue to purple. Circle that and put a question mark over it. Something else to notice is that the rock cut architecture is also in the broken land, but on far more gargantuan scales. The dark shrine in particular has a vestry room, which is another word for the sacristy. This is the room where you would expect the sacrarium drain would be located. It's the drain of the piscina, the basin near the altar. There are two basins in the dark chapel, but they are braziers of the altar. The smashed stone faces, perhaps, are supposed to be graven images. Catholic churches may have statues, for example, while Protestants do not allow it. I do not necessarily think I have the exact intent of every detail, but the bathing pool in the monastery privy is a piscina in the older Roman usage of the word. I'm not, by the way, going out of my way to try to pronounce things right in Latin. Church Latin and classical Latin pronounce the same words differently. That's way too much effort, switching back and forth. I'm mentioning that because the pronunciation of ecclesiastical Latin ended up varying culturally because of local vernacular, and that could have some subtextual relevance to part of Kaigar's lore expansion of the Irrere glossary, because we have some implication with the Dark Shrine and Temple of Darkness Palm that the dead language of Irrere was retained for dark religious rites, which we see in the backstory for the graveyard as well, Kadina Throckfarok passed down by the Ilari. The Dark Path Theocracy also used rosaries to worship Kadena, which are actually a specifically Catholic thing for venerating the Holy Mother, which I mentioned in my graveyard series. But vestries are where the clerical vestments are stored, as well as sacred objects, such as the vessels for holy substances. The monastery does not have a shared room for vestments. The iron spikes in the monastic cells, I think, were for hanging their clothes, though it might be how they impaled themselves through their chests. While it's clear from the room painting that the vestry is where the clothes were hanged, there is also a large chest and larger cabinet, which are empty and rotted, which presumably stored such sacred objects. So taking this more literally as a sort of black mass, what would these be? Well, there are urns of foul black fluid in the dark shrine and a tapestry depicting it being poured from the urns by sycophants of, or perhaps even by, the demonic-looking Morgu himself onto a broken body on the altar. These would be a dark analog of, say, the cruets stored in a vestry. The large cabinet would be akin to a chrismatorium. So if we follow through on the logic of that parallel, this is likely a blasphemous inversion of the holy oils, what you use for consecrating altars, anointing clergy or the sick, and performing baptisms where the church aquarium is about, for example, not pouring used baptismal water into the sewer. So this inverted baptism would be playing into that whole spirit born of death thing, or, and perhaps even some sinister analog of the mortification of the flesh. The sacrificial altar in this case being used for torture and human sacrifice and dark rituals. The black fluid from the urns presumably ends up in the tall stone jars. It probably has something to do with feeding or waking the gagore because the bodies in the burial vault would be cultists, so their bodies are probably not turned into gagore. Who knows, though? But it is plausible the black fluid is made nutritive through being poured on sacrificed bodies first. The toad braziers would be analogs of vigil lamps, which are typically made of brass. These usually use olive oil, which is the usual ingredient in the holy oils. So this is consecrating the bodies and maybe the altar itself. There is also an altar bell that is rung in churches for the Eucharist ceremony. Anglicans ring it three times, which I'll bring up again later. That would be what the brass gong is about with this subtext. They would ring the gong when handling the urns, their analog of the holy vessels. Also, in Roman Catholicism, the use of a gong specifically as the altar bell was actually ruled inappropriate by the Curia at the Vatican in 1898. And recall what I said about the consecration of Anchorite monks, 
is like a funeral rite becoming dead to the world. The bishop would recite the office of the dead, prayers for the repose of the soul of the deceased, when the anchorite entered their cell. Unlike the monastery, there is no indication the dark shrine was designed for monks to live in, only to die and be buried. This is far from the only parallel between the two sides of that portal, as we will now see. In the second episode, we ran into struggles over the chronology, trying to figure out how old the dark shrine is relative to Uthex Cathiasis. There are some reasons to think it should date back to the first era, over 100,000 years ago. The cavern itself, that is, not the cult use of it. Dark priests in the second era would find Gagor, the Verul, in ancient crypts from the first era. The entrance poem is apparently describing Morgu as a guardian of Kadena. Empress Kadena was the one who created the Gagor, and she has been dead for 100,000 years. The vast rock-cut architecture seems like terraforming at a scale beyond the scope of ordinary mortal means or methods. Though granted, if the Crystal Dome is ancient Lord of Essence technology, that itself is the means for it. So the Gagor should have been there since the first era, and would have been woken up in the second era. But Morgu himself goes around plundering crypts in the second era, collecting the Gagor. And this place looks like it was designed to be used by Morgu himself. Except it also looks like it was built to be a temple, where the Dark Priest should not have first been there until much later than the first era. And that huge statue, for example, would not have been lifted up there later. Though I will say the statue has colors and the wings are leathery, which makes you wonder what it's actually made of if it's oil-painted stone or something else. You would think it's a stone carving, for example, but it doesn't actually say. It might be made of metal, or even literally black skin and leather. If it was made out of Gagor, getting it up there becomes moot, because the tall stone jars have Gagor in them. I'll come back to this issue later. But regardless, it is facing the wall on the other side of the huge stairwell part of the magical teleportation mechanism for it, which implies it's all designed together. This seems to be ancient spoken Iraq, but is written in relatively modern alphabetic script. It is also found in a poem that seems to refer to conditions from the Third Era, or at least from the end of Wars of Dominion. But if they have ancient speakers of Iraq and can build this stuff in the Second Era themselves, why would they need Uthex for anything? Whatever the intent was likely has aspects that seem weird. You have various aspects for why Morgu himself should not be expected to have been there in the various time periods. It is something of a timey wimey mess, possibly complicated with time warp or future scene premises. If the shrine was instead made by Uthex, for example, the dome must still be First Era. The core premise is that Uthex discovered a new source of power there. It unravels too much of the premise for him to invent everything. And you would have the weirdness of the Gagor even being there, or else the knowledge of how they were made was somehow present. The Urrera could be something weird like Kadena became Orgiana, and Morgu is still her servant in the Second Era. Then Kadena cultists in Second Era make the shrine to Morgu in the old place of the Lords of Essence, whether or not Morgu himself was ever actually present for it. Or perhaps he was, but only many millennia earlier. I will give a more radical option later. These parallels with the monastery suggest this may be approaching it somewhat the wrong way. What if this is scratching something too hard that has more allegorical meaning? There may be details that are motivated for other narrative reasons. In the Graveyard series, we had a similar issue with a parallel between the Graveyard and the Landing Temple. These would have been 6,000 years apart, and there were other issues similar to it. How does this guy from 6,000 years ago parallel stuff that did not exist yet? But the graveyard had what I called an everything is backwards motif to it. The dark path was apparently a dark mirror of the death religion. Issa and Kadena treat it as opposing death goddesses. So what if this dark mirror notion is present in the broken land as well? What if some things seem inconsistent because they are really allegory? The logic for Morgu not being there gets turned on its head because it might be intentionally backwards because this is a backwards place. In the second episode, we interpreted the wreckage and library burning in the Dark Shrine as suggesting the lore masters were up there, which would require all that to, at the latest, have been contemporary with Uthex Cathayasis. But if it is a dark mirror of the monastery, the monks destroyed their own chapel. It isn't obvious why the Dark Shrine should be self-wrecked in the same way. 
But the point may be that they are dark mirrors of each other, even though it's happening at entirely different times. So, in the second episode, I played devil's advocate on how the broken land could be a corona under certain very exotic special conditions. Aside from the blank check that everything is wrong gives, that still gives some internal consistency issues, not least of which because the backstory calls the broken land another plane of existence. You do not want to assume our canon is wrong when we have the Deutero canon be wrong. Now, you might be thinking I'm speculating wildly at this point, doing some freeform what-ifs, but I'm about to totally shake up the way you've ever thought about the Broken Lands. What if we go the other way and interpret it as a dark mirror of this world? That instead of Corone, it is Kothea as it exists in another dimension. Something more like the Upside Down from Stranger Things. What possible argument could I make for that? Well, for one thing, it was done very blatantly about a year or two later in Shadow Valley. Secluded Valley and Shadow Valley are identical except for a few inverted details. White becomes black, quiet becomes loud, that kind of thing. It is much more subtle than that in the Broken Land. The only room where it is glaringly obvious is the Misty Chamber, which is the same place as it exists in separate dimensions. It is perhaps some kind of crossover or bleed-through point. A natural gateway, as the backstory words it. Perhaps this was caused by the unusual Corona and Orhan alignment later depicted in the Laura's Shrine, because one of the ways natural portals form in Kalthea is from unusual celestial alignments. But then you follow through on this logic and the parallel keeps going. When you're outside the monastery, there is a finger-shaped boulder pointing the way to the waterfall, which has a hidden opening leading to the monastery and Mystic Chamber. Then you look in the southwest corner of the jagged plain, and you have a finger-shaped boulder, pointing the way to the opening toward Uthex's abode in the Misty Chamber. Next to the finger-shaped boulder in the Seal Far Strake is a rock slide. Adjacent to the opening on the jagged plain, there's a rock slide. So if you look closely around the lake outside the monastery, there's fog that gives the Pumas a defensive bonus. This is directly paralleled by the jagged plain fog from the steam coming off the boiling sea of mud. The directional orientation is backwards, north from the misty chamber in this universe, south from the misty chamber in the parallel universe. More broadly, Clay's Rim Bay is responsible for the fog in this part of Kelborn, which is mentioned in the Seal Far Strake room painting. And that is describing the bay being to the north, while the boiling sea of mud in the Broken Land is to the south. Kelborn is foggy on its south side because the ocean current brings in water warmer than the air. The mountains are instead north of the boiling sea in the broken land. Instead of the forest, you have the crystal forest. The parallel to the barren plain is more obscure because you do not actually see it in the Seal Far Strait, but that is all right next to the high plateau, which is essentially a huge barren plain. Then you may start noticing more subtle things, like Uthex had a four-poster bed near the Misty Chamber, as does the Abbot, except Uthex is, is as far away as possible, and it is not hidden, whereas the Abbot's room is hiding the Misty Chamber. The Uthex version even hints at it, likening the sagging bed to resembling four monks bowing to a mattress altar. That the monastery has a tapestry of Orohan, and the broken landside has a bas-relief where you push Corona. While the lake and waterfall are ice cold, there's a hot spring under the mountain. Then on the broken land side, you have geysers in the boiling sea of mud. And you have water, ice melts falling down into the dark cavern, which makes a small underground river for the Miklian. Likewise, there's an underground river below the monastery's mountain, which is how the lake made by the waterfall empties out. Both of these underground lakes are in rooms called Huge Cavern with megalithic architecture. The stream flows east and ultimately south in the broken land. The river flows west and ultimately north to the bay. The lakes on both sides have no visible exit streams. They both have to empty out by streaming underground. You could argue the mushroom fairy rings in the Seal Far Strake are a fungus parallel. If you wanted to press the point, both sides have stone stairway puzzles. You go down to the jagged plain, but up to the Seal Far Strake. And then there's what I was talking about before with the monastery. There's a chapel on one side, a dark chapel on the other side, one underneath the mountain, the other high up in the mountain. The frescoes and statues in the dark chapel parallel the gallery in the monastery. 
There's a smashed altar with a brazier and hidden room on both sides. There are empty or destroyed libraries for both sides. The chapels have floor mosaics on both sides. There's even a pile of rocks under the monastery formed by rat snakes slithering through the sewers. And in the dark grotto, itself formed by a kind of irregular slithering, the McGrew have apparently made their own pile of stone orbs. Their waste, of course, is the bone pit. And while the monastery's plumbing is hydraulic engineering, as you will see near the end of this episode, the McGrew have been engaging in their own form of plumbing with the Dark Rado. Much more subtly, then, there are some parallels between the creatures, partly defunct, if your mind is, you know, not sufficiently blown yet. In the Sealfar Strake, you have the Smoky Caverns, where the fire cats used to inflict fire flares with their claws. Then in the Dark Grotto, or the Huge Cavern, the Kiska Rax, the Miklian, still inflict cold flares with their claws. In the McGrew, the looks of Troglock may have been made from now missing Trog, which were demon summoning cavern dwelling Black Panther things. The fire rats would parallel the bice bones in the bone pit. Maybe this says something for the McGrew being heat immune. There are arguably hollows in the caves in both places. Though, as we will see later, the niches in the Dark Grotto are really parallel to a purely implicit detail in the Monastery's Chapel. The Spectral Monks, if you watch them while dead, have their hoods dropped, revealing they are nothing but blazing green eyes. Their burning green eyes are in their creature description, along with the idea of being barely bound to this plane, which in turn can be a parallel to the glowing green orbs that the Gagora have for eyes in the Dark Shrine. The monastic liches having glowing red eyes might explain the Gagor statues having red eyes, especially if those statues are actually really just Gagor in some fashion, similar to how liches and spectrals were made from the same monks. Gagor, remember, are essentially statues, leathery gargoyles, which raises a much more disturbing and extreme possibility. Imagine if the huge statue is actually Morgu himself sleeping, it has the deity avatar height, 12 feet. <laughs> Monastic liches summon Kilin through rifts, which on the face of it is odd, because these are elements associated with chimeras, not extraplanar entities. But as I have said previously, their description is matching the benevolent Kirin from the Romaster version. There is an evil Kilin, which does not look this way. But what might really be going on here is that the liches summon evil versions of the Kirin from this dark mirror world. Though I will say that Rollmaster Kirin actually have teleportation powers, while the Rollmaster Kirin can only fly around in the sky. But something with the broken land side is that it explicitly contrasts the scenery with the sylvan wildlife and greenery you would see in this world. And recall the authorial intent from previous episodes. Kaigar referring to the Seofar Strake as a sylvan setting for contrast. It speaks of how desolate it is in that way when looking out the windows of the Dark Shrine, and it talks about the absence of furry animals in the Mickling Cavern. Then, what is most fascinating, you look at the bone pit in the Dark Grotto. There are bones of creatures you've never seen before, but there are also these mice bones. That's another huge blow to the idea that this is actually under the moon of the Dark Gods. Because while extraplanar entities might wander their way in through portals, there is no reason mammals like mice would have been on Karun. You can't even bring familiars to the portal. It is saying something profound. There may have once been an environment in this place where that kind of wildlife lived, which strongly suggests it was all wiped out by the McGrew, the Lugshuk Trogloc. And that's when we start getting to the point. There are parallel material worlds in the Shadow World cosmology, which are essentially Kalthea in other dimensions, with minor differences. They are very difficult to access, and trying to go there is dangerous, because you will likely overshoot into the Chaos Planes. So we have references here and there in those books, even in 1990, calling those negative planes of the unlife. The Broken Land may be a parallel negative dimension where the unlife dominated, where this is essentially an upside-down, evil Seofar Strake. Then we have the Shadow World timeline from 1990, where those powerful crystals were on Crone, opening portals. These portals were leading to parallel dimensions, which may well have meant those parallel worlds. But when Sarkane ripped the dormant portals open, it bridged them to the negative or chaos planes. 
So the Dark Gods may have come here, or places like here, to Kurunk in the Second Era, which would be consistent with interpreting this as an abandoned First Era dimension, and perhaps expose the parallel world to the Dark Gods and the Unlife, or even somehow entangle that dimension with Kurunk. Of course, that does not explain the falling rocks or other arguments for being underground, and the mountains possibly being artificial. We come back to this issue of Kurung being a gate world hovering on the boundaries between dimensions, and there are areas in Shadow World which coexist in multiple places or times simultaneously. This may well in some fashion be a Kurung associated realm regardless, and if everything is backwards or inverted, then that itself might motivate the evil Seofar Strake being underground, quite possibly not even on this world, but under Kurung as exists in another dimension. Though I will say that if it is another dimension, the literal reasons for it being underground get really weak. When you have such a weird place, you have to entertain really weird possibilities. But what if we were to interpret the Broken Land as literally weird fiction? So in my Graveyard series, I made arguments for this very thing. That Bander Etrevion is best understood as Lovecraftian, driven mad with esoteric and forbidden knowledge, of dead elder races and otherworldly powers. There was language in aspects of the graveyard and the death mechanics that seemed to be references to H.P. Lovecraft stories. These were mostly from his dream cycle stories, most especially from the dream quest of Unknown Kadath. His end scene uses extremely similar wording to the soul departure messaging, but in this series I will make an additional argument that those very same Lovecraft stories are referenced in the design of the broken land. That's a bold statement, but as you'll see, the case for it is very strong. It would be one hell of a weird coincidence. The Broken Land seems to mostly be influenced by the story starring Randolph Carter. These include the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath and the Silver Key stories, especially his Through the Gates of the Silver Key. Maybe some others, but mostly the Carter stories. I will try to resist jumping around between the various stories too much, but to some extent explaining the mythos context is unavoidable, and I have to, well, actually check myself sometimes. There's a lot of stuff to keep track of with it, but we also want to stay on focus. So, we will start with the Dream Quest of Anunno Kadath, then the Silver Key, and then any others that might weirdly matter. These are long, short stories. The Dream Quest is actually a novella. It has over 40,000 words. So I will loosely summarize their plot lines first. Hashtag spoilers. The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath centers on a protagonist named Randolph Carter, an occultist who is one of Lovecraft's author surrogate characters. He's basically a stand in for Lovecraft himself, an underappreciated horror writer from New England. Lovecraft isn't known for his characterization skills. So his narrators often resemble himself. In this one, the narrator is Carter. Carter is a relatively young man in the story, but an adult, and he is having dreams of a marvelous city. He prays to the gods of Earth's dreamlands for the location of this marvelous dream city. But then he stops having dreams of it, so he is no longer content with just asking. The dream quest is Randolph Carter seeking out the gods of Earth's dreamlands to confront them about his dream city. The Dreamlands are a parallel dimension to this one, where there is a Dreamland version of the same places. There is an Earth of the Dreamlands, the Moon of the Dreamlands, and Saturn, and so on. People access this dimension through dreams, though the older you are, the less likely you can access it. The few who can do it can become major figures, like the king of their own city, though there are supposedly spots where you can physically cross over. Time passes differently in the Dreamlands. Carter goes on a long quest, but he's sleeping in his bed. The gods of Earth's dreamland now reside in an onyx castle on the cold mountain of Kadath. This is a forbidden place, and mortals do not know where it is, nor try to go there. Early in the story, Carter is warned against trying to do this by priests on the edge of the dreamlands, who say it is dangerous, and that the gods were probably the ones that stopped his dreams. Pretty much anyone Carter runs into thinks this is a terrible idea, and he should drop it. But YOLO, so he has to try to figure out where Kadath is, since no one knows. On his journey, a priest in Ulthar tells him of a mountain called Negranic, whose face is carved in the likeness of the gods. 
This is a forbidden face not to be looked at, of course, so people do not know what it looks like. Things being too terrible to describe is a hallmark for Lovecraft. He is notorious for it. Negronic is an extinct volcano where the gods lived before moving to Kadath. This dead volcano is also an opening to the underworld. Carter gets the idea that if he can see what the gods look like, he will be able to tell what mixed race bloodline in the dreamland is most closely descended from them, which will then point him in the right direction. If that sounds kind of racist, it's because it is. Lovecraft was pretty self-consciously racist, and miscegenation was a horror motif in his stories. He became very left-wing later in his life during the Great Depression, but it is what it is. Fear of the foreign is deeply woven into his horror. Unnatural crossbreeding and mixtures of features as horror. Xenophobia. Very foreign, much horror. Perhaps that's part of what the Keelan are about in the monastery, because the Keelan are actually camera monsters. But Carter then gets taken on a detour. He is kidnapped by almost human turban slavers, who bring him up to the moon, which is covered with obscene fungi, delivering him to toad-like moon beasts who serve the malevolent Nyarlathotep, the messenger of the other gods, otherworldly demonic powers who undulate in madness outside of time and space. Carter will later discover in the quest these almost human slavers are actually men of length, who are pan-like, resembling satyrs, with hooves and horns under their turbans. But he is intervened upon and saved from the moon by the cats of Ulthar, who he had treated well earlier in the story. Go kitties! The cats bring him back to the port on Earth, and Carter goes back to trying to travel to the mountain of the Granic which is on the Isle of Oriab. When Carter finds his way to Granic and climbs his way up so he can see the forbidden face, he recognizes it as looking like the traitors from Inganok he has seen visiting the city of Salaface in the Dreamlands. But just at that moment, he is kidnapped by night gods who fly him through the dead volcano down into the underworld, because the night gods guard all of the gateways and passages down into the underworld. He has to find his way back up to the surface from the underworld, which will be dangerous, but he can't just wake up, because if he wakes up, he could lose most of his memories of what has happened. He could lose his memory of the mountain face or what it even means. So he gets out with the help of some ghouls of the underworld, and then he makes his way to the city of Salaface. The king of Salaface is someone Carter knew from the waking world. The guy died and now permanently resides in the dreamlands. The dreamlands can act as a kind of afterlife. So Carter tries to go north to Inganok, where these traders are from, but gets kidnapped again, flown over the dreaded Plateau of Lang, and brought to its hateful monastery. The men of Lang turn out to be the slavers, who are described as almost human, because their satire qualities are hidden under turbans in their clothes. The prehistoric zone monastery has a masked figure called the High Priest Not to be Described, whose identity Carter instantly recognizes and flees from in horror. He has to escape from the monastery, comes out next to a vertical cliff, then gathers some night gods, frees three of the ghouls, who help them out of the underworld, fights some moon beasts with the boys, and travels north to Kadath. He goes to Kadath with a procession of night gods because, as it turns out, they have treaties with the ghouls and a secret password. They have to fly over the cold waste north of Inganok instead of over the more immediate plateau of Lang because of abysmal influences centering on hemispheres built on the northern plateau, which are associated with Nyarlathotep and the other gods, and even the night gods avoid them. They fly up the side of the mountain with the enormous castle of Kadath, and Carter thinks he detected unpleasant shadows floating against the feeble light as they approach the top, passing over cyclopean stairs and cold vortices of wind, until they reach the gateway and get swept up through into the window of the throne room. When Carter has finally made his way into Gadath, where the gods should be, he discovers that they are missing. His whole nightmarish procession with him has vanished, and then another ritual procession shows up. The Nyarlathotep walks in looking like a pharaoh crossed with a fallen archangel. The gods of Earth's dreamland essentially belong to the other gods. He mockingly and ironically commends Carter for his audacity, which would ordinarily be punished with death. Nyarlathotep tells Carter that his marvelous dream city is actually just his boyhood memories of Boston, and that the gods of Earth's dreamland escaped Kadath and went there instead. He says he is sparing Carter, now tasked with returning them to Kadath. 
because they are in Carter's own personal half-waking dreamland and claims he is the only one who can reach it. Then he sends Carter hurtling off into space on a bird-like monster called a Shantak. But Nyarlathotep is a malevolent trickster with a mocking, ironic sense of humor. He told Carter the safe way home and how to easily convince the Earth gods to return, but he gave Carter no control over the flight path of the Shantak bird. He's actually sending Carter to his doom at the center of the universe, to the court of madness of the blind idiot god, the demon Sultan Azatoth, with his infernal flutes and mindless gibbering dancers, lost to the demonic, so to speak, because madness and the void's wild vengeance are Nyarlathotep's only gifts to the presumptuous. But Carter suddenly remembers he is only dreaming, so he leaps from the Shantak into the infinite void of darkness, then a surreal cycle of cosmic time happens around him as he falls into the black void, until finally the world of his waking memories rushes back to him. Narlatotep snatches up the gods himself in that half-waking moment and brings them back to the castle of Kadath in the cold wastes. The spirit departure of death messaging is almost quoting from sentences of that end scene, and the deep underground of the graveyard arguably symbolizes it. The Shadow Valley exit probably does too, maybe even some other things. So, what does this have to do with the broken land? Well, in the most general terms, we have a parallel dimension with disturbing dream versions of the same things. And the gods are supposed to be there, but in spite of evidence that they were once there, the gods are missing or nowhere to be found. It involves a place the gods used to reside, and they are no longer there now. This much is certainly consistent with the apparent broken land situation. But much more specifically, we have to look at the underworld. The landscape of the Broken Land, especially the Dark Grotto from early 1994, is a very strong parallel to the underworld of the Dreamlands. This is a short scene of only a few pages in the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, and almost every part of it is reflected in the Broken Land. There's even a certain obvious resemblance between the terms Dreamland and Broken Land. Obviously, the Shruvian Monastery is for the Nightmare God, but that was built later. There seemingly isn't any link in his design to this Lovecraft stuff. So, first consider Carter trying to climb the sheer vertical cliffs, because he's an expert dreamer, to look at a hidden face on a mountain. Now look at the jagged plain having unclimbable sheer vertical cliffs, as if it was cut with a gargantuan knife. You go up the rock slide and find yourself on a perch feeling like you're being watched. You can compare how close the wording is between the two texts. Directly above this perch, way high above out of sight, are the windows on the west end of the dark shrine which are described as like two huge eyes with a deadly sheer drop-off outside them. The implication of falling to your doom is also done on the huge stairway, which is probably playing on the end scene of Dream Quest. Dark vortices may refer to the outside of Kadath near the end, which has its own huge cyclopean stairway, but this is strongly implying, given the subtext, that there is a face carved on the mountain. It most likely resembles Morgu, and by extension, his Gagor servants, the Vrul. They would fly in and out of it if their wing sizes match the gravity. But there's no way to see the face because you cannot climb it. Which might also play on the end scene at Kadath, when the night gods fly Carter through the window, as well as Kadath's corridor, where he suddenly finds himself in the throne room, which is essentially the design of the Dark Shrine. But this would be a mashup. What we mostly care about is from earlier in the story the huge stone face hidden on the mountain in the underworld. So you have this perch where you are feeling watched, which is at the entrance to the Dark Grotto. The Dark Vortices, if they were based on Nykarak from Rollmaster, would be able to cause feelings of being watched. But I think the intent is more likely to be that there is a huge stone face above that spot. When Carter is on the, this perch, he is kidnapped by the Night Gods, which happen to be a creature in that same non-demon extraplanar entity section from Rollmaster. The night gaunts are all black, without eyes, rubbery with bat-like wings. So they look very similar to the Gagor, the Vrul. They are soul destroyers in Rollmaster. And like the Gagor, they are known for swooping down, picking up people, and flying off with them. The night gaunts guard the entrances to the underworld in the Dreamlands. So Carter gets kidnapped by night gaunts, and they fly him down. He has flown over the peaks of Thok, or peaks of Throk, depending on which copy you are reading, which is a whole mountain range that exists underground below the Dreamlands, where the sky is dimly lit by pale, phosphorescent vapor called Deathfire. 
You're also phosphorescent cloud in the northern night sky on the surface of the dreamland. The broken land is a lot older than the day-night mechanics, so that does not help us at all. Throck happens to be an Eroeric word, and it appears under the bas relief in the Dark Shrine entry puzzle. Then the peaks are far away as the night gods bring their victims into the nethermost grottos. The night gods then drop them into a vast deep bone pit called the Vale of Panath, where, as you recall, there's a deep bone pit in the dark grotto, which is easy to enter but difficult to climb out of. There are huge thigh bones around Carter in the Vale of Panath, and we see the exact same thing in our bone pit. The ghouls hear him calling out and toss down a ladder before he gets eaten by one of the beholes. They are basically huge rotor things, but those aren't in our bone pit. Carter emerges on a huge boulder strewn plain with entrances to burrows, and then has to crawl his way through the moldy burrow tunnels, which is what we have with the dark grotto and the jacket plain, except their relative positions are backwards. The smooth rounding on our bone pit looks more like the pit dropping into the vaults of Zinn, in the evil nameless monastery next to the plateau of Lang on the surface, but this is still all on the ground in the underworld. The ghouls, as you may notice, lope around. Lope is the spawn message of the Vrul, the Gagor. One of the ghouls is someone else Carter knew in life who's dead now, named Pikmin, who is from other Wolfcraft stories. Carter gets him to help him back to the enchanted woods, which is a fungal forest. To get there, they have to quietly pass through the city of the Gugs. The Gugs are huge, and they have to pass by the Vaults of Zin, or at least one entrance to the Vaults of Zin underground, which is where the cannibalistic ghasts are residing, and the Dark Shrine uses the word ghastly for the morgue statue at the top of the stairs. Gugs, ghouls, and ghasts feed on each other when they can manage to pull it off, which is why there are so many bones of various sizes tossed down into the Vale Panath. So there are tall monoliths in the Gug city, which are covered with fungus. And there's a Tower of Koth, which leads up to the surface, having a trap door that the Gugs are forbidden to use because of a curse of the gods, which exits out of the underworld into the fungal forest of the enchanted woods. So we have a huge cavern in the dark grotto, the forest of tall stone spires covered in fungus. Then with the Tower of Koth, Carter and the ghouls have to go up an enormous stairway, where the steps themselves are huge. Gug sized, and Carter keeps getting winded, stretching so high up that the cavern below recedes into darkness, which is exactly what happens with the huge stairs in the dark grotto. Eventually, it's too dark to see below into the huge cavern. Each up movement is several steps, and the RT is from getting winded. The ghouls have to keep helping Carter get up the stairs. They kill the gas on the stairs, and later, when Carter was about to escape out the trap door to the enchanted woods, they heard the gas body rolling down the stairs somewhere in the distance, which you can actually do in Gemstone with the limb disruption spell. Totally delimb someone in rooms with down direction. Their body will go rolling on a joyride. So the ghouls had to come with him because this could only mean something horrible was rushing up the huge stairs toward them. The stairs of the Tower of Koth have a colossal doorway with a monstrous symbol called the Sign of Koth which is a symbol in vast relief, which made one shudder without knowing its meaning. So at the top of the huge stairway in the broken land, we have a vast relief, which has a monstrous symbol of a large beast on it, Morgu, with writing under it in strange dead language. And this is a magical doorway. This is a very tight parallel, even if it is not every single last detail. It's actually backwards on some points. The sign of Koth is at the base of the stairs, the bas relief of Morku is at the top of the stairs. The glowing fungal forest is through a trap door to the surface at the top of the stairs, whereas the glowing fungal forest in the huge cavern is at the bottom of the stairs. The dark shrine notably breaks from it and works some other concept. So if you do not buy this is really there, I can't help you, because this is very blatant, almost as blatant as the tarot card rooms in the rift. The dark shrine seems to be a mixture of several things. Kadath itself with Nyarlathotep, the nameless monastery with the high priest not to be described, who is often interpreted to be another avatar of Nyarlathotep, though others interpret it as the king in yellow, some Catholic stuff, some Shadow World stuff, some Silver Key stuff, but not really any more directly Underworld stuff. So, the Dark Shrine has toe-shaped braziers next to its altar, 
and the Kisco rocks or Miklian are described as like amphibians. These do not seem to be based on a role master creature and could play off the moon beasts serving Nyarlathotep. These are also referred to as toad things in the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, though they do not physically resemble the Miklian. The looks of Trogloc, the Gru, actually look more like the toad things. They more closely resemble Shoggoths in Lovecraft terms, though they are slightly like toad things as well, wiggly and ichor covered like jellyfish. On spec, the moon beasts should have nothing to do with the underworld of the dream ones. But as I will explain later, Nikons did drop some moon beasts down there. It's just not from the same scene of the dream quest. The cats of Althar hate the moon beast toad things, but there are large, peculiar cats from Saturn who are allied with them. I have no idea if that is relevant, but I'm mentioning it because of my Trog and Lukshuk Troglock conjecture that there might have once been subterranean large cats and the McGrew ate them. And the McGrew, as I said, are more similar to Shoggoths. The corresponding scene of night gaunts in the peaks of Thok in Lovecraft's Fungi from the Agoth has a foul lake where Shoggoths splash, and there's something like that in the Dark Grotto, where you have a stalactite with water dripping off it and forming a small pond. I'll bring up the Shoggoths later when I talk about At the Mountains of Madness. Fungi from Yagoth is a sonnet sequence where the narrator picks up an esoteric book in a store and, as a result of this bad decision, is transported to many eldritch vistas until eventually he gets transported back to an old farmhouse through an ether across time and space. Something more subtle about the fungi from Yagoth is that Yagoth is on some material universe world called Nathan. Yagoth was then reinterpreted in The Whisper in Darkness, written around the same time is taken to be the then newly discovered and now former planet Pluto. And the peaks of Thok get treated instead as, as on a moon of Yagoth, but Pluto's big moon, discovered in 1978, is named Corone, the same name as the moon of the Dark Gods. That's probably just a coincidence. It is way too buried in the subtext. Corone is from mythology. He's the ferryman of the underworld. He's also the first boat driver of hell in Dante's Inferno but it would have been cool if that was intentional. By the way, I might point out little mythological things with the Broken Land, but I do not see a comparative mythology allegory in it, not counting the Lovecraft mythos, of course. Only incidental things, like the Night Gaunts in the Dream Quest are servants of the god Nodens, who is a rival of Nyarlathotep. Nodens is the god of the underworld in the Dream Quest. Nikons guard the entrances of the underworld. Nodens is actually a real-world Brythonic god. He's the father of Gwynapnid, the king of Anwen in the Arthurian legend, the Welsh name for the Otherworld, which Castle Anwen is clearly named after. I very much doubt that detail is anything more than coincidence, any sort of broken land in Castle Anwen linked through it. The Dream Quest itself was inspired by fey mythology through at least the influence of fantasy stories by Lord Dunsany, but I think any myth allegory in the Broken Land is limited to a basic dead gods of the underworld theme. Orgiana was likely based on the Viking death goddess Hel, for example, and the Black Hell may matter, but I do not see the Norse Hel itself or herself in the Broken Land, unlike the graveyard, which has some Viking concepts in it, notwithstanding the runes of warding on the portal. But one thing I mentioned is that the Dreamlands is a parallel of places that exist in this universe, not just of the Earth and Moon and so on, but more specific places. The Plateau of Lang is unambiguously in the Dreamlands, for example, in the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. But in At the Mountains of Madness, Lang and Kadath are thought to be in Antarctica. And in The Hound, the Necronomicon says Lang is in Central Asia. Then you have the Vaults of Zin. These are in a cavern with an opening next to the city of Gux in the underworld of the Dreamlands. The vaults of Zin are below the hateful monastery of Lang and whatever else in the Dreamlands. But the vaults of Zin in the waking world are deep on the ground below North America in a story called The Mound, which might be relevant to Shadow Valley. There is a reptilian race there that worshipped the toad god Sithagora, who Lovecraft borrowed from Clark Ashton Smith. But they devolved into quadrupeds, similar to the Miklian, after discovering a horror deep below in Unkai, where Unkai is next to the vaults of Zin as they exist in our own dimension. 
The horror, of course, was Shoggoths. Never wake up the Shoggoths. So there are arguably Mechlian and McGrew analogs in the waking world version of the Vaults of Zen, though that would be a very buried detail and it's not in the Dream Quest. The full text of the mound actually wasn't published until 1989 in an anthology of stories ghost written by Lovecraft. Actually, in the extended Lovecraft mythos, including the Lovecraft Circle writers, these degenerate reptiles were once the serpent men of Illusia. Lovecraft mentions them in The Haunter of the Dark as having once possessed the shining trapezohedron, which originated on Ugoth. The serpent men were invented by Robert Howard, and their presence in that region is in Clark Ash and Smith's The Seven Geuses, though he only refers to serpent men, not specifically Volusia, and it does not mention the place names. That detail is supposedly in the Encyclopedia Cthulhuana, published by Chaosium in 1994 which might just be an interpretation of the term serpent men. But they are not mentioned by name in that place by Lovecraft himself, as far as I can tell. That's deep esoterica. There's almost no way that level of interrelation is relevant. I'm mentioning it because Thagua, the toad god, came from Clark Ashton Smith's Hyperborean cycle stories, such as the seven Geuses. Geuses, or however you pronounce that. In that story, you go down the extinct volcano Mount Vormathedrith, now in the Arctic, and pass by Sadagua, and you eventually run into the serpent men deep underground doing their experiments. And we'd be cross-referencing with Robert Howard's Hyborian cycle stories. This is fair because the continent names from these cycles appear in various Lovecraft stories. For example, Clark's Camorium and Howard's Illusia, among others, like Atlantis, are both in At the Mountains of Madness, and Comorium and Atlantis are both mentioned next to Nkai in The Whisper in Darkness, which is about intelligent alien fungus creatures from Yagoth. But the vaults of Zin are under North America. The Beholes of the Bone Pit also have an analog called the Holes, destroying Yadith in Through the Gates of the Silver Key. So you get the general idea. Same place names also existing in the waking world which raises the question of why they are in both dimensions. And places near each other in the Dreamlink can be far apart in our world, or even on other worlds. So even if the Broken Land is the evil parallel of the Seal of Our Strake, it could be located on the Moon Corona of that dimension. Now, Lovecraft is not much for canon. His place names are used in contradictory ways across the stories. For his characters, it's a lot of occult and esoteric knowledge in forbidden books anyway. He just recycles the terms between stories, whether or not it's consistent. Maybe it's imperfectly understood from different sources. There's definitely overlap between the stories, but in general it is inconsistent. You still have the situation of the same places existing or coexisting in this dimension as well as the parallel dimension. So that premise could easily be relevant if other Lovecraft stories are relevant to the Broken Land. The presence of this Dream Quest parallel does not really help us at all on the Moon question because the whole premise of it is that it's a parallel dimension to this world, but this part of the dimension is an underground mountain range, and the story has analogs of Mickley and called Moon Beasts, where you can just sail to the moon in the dreamlands. That scene with the cats and the toad thing Moon Beasts actually takes place on the moon of the dreamlands. And if both the moon and the underworld of the dreamland are represented in the broken land, that guts our ability to use a dreamland as evidence for one or the other. But if you interpret the jelly-like McGrew as moon beast analogs, as the moon beasts are described as like jellyfish, there are actually some in the underworld because the night gods later in the story dropped some into the Vale of Panath, the city of Gugs, and so on, so they would get killed. And that section talks about how choking and malodorous the air is down there. So maybe it's just the underworld in spite of the moon beasts, but it leaves open the question which aspects are the allegory that it's underground, or that it is actually a parallel dimension. If the allegory is only that it's underground, it could just be deep under the surface of Corone. Or it could be both underground and the parallel dimension. Even Corone as it is in the parallel dimension. Or merely symbolically the underworld. What about the Silver Key stories? The basic premise of those is that when Randolph Carter gets old, he wanders into a cave near his uncle's old farm called the Snake Den. This has a gateway in it that returns him back in time to his youth, where he mostly does not remember his former life. 
except now he lives his life over again with some prophetic ability to know things have not happened yet. Then, and through the gates of the Silver Key, he goes to the cave again and goes missing. Eventually, he is presumed dead, and relatives are trying to divide up his estate, though an eccentric elderly student of Carter's is objecting to it, arguing Carter is still alive in another time dimension. So, at the apportionment meeting for settling the estate, a Hindu Swami named Chandraputra tells them a fantastic story of what happened to Carter. Hindu swamis are people who have mastered a particular yoga tradition. They're called a chakra in the monastery. The gist of it is that Carter has an antique key, which you bring into this cave inside a cave. You end up vanishing from this reality into Earth's higher dimensional extension. Carter finds a quasi-sphere that pulsates with inexplicable light, which is what the crystal dome is and does on the jagged plane. And its height versus width is not quite spherical about the height of a deity avatar. Though the Crystal Dome most likely also refers to the dreaded white hemispheres built on the northern plateau of Lang in the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, which are associated in common folklore with the other gods, such as Azatoth, Nyarlathotep, and Yogg-Sothoth. Interestingly, the paragraph just before this quasi-sphere refers to a yogi who visited a forbidden city in Lang, which is named Yin Ho. Yin is a city in Robert Chambers' story, The Maker of Moves, which refers to the leader of a sect of sorcerers who corrupted the good genie of China, the Xin, into monsters who control reptile satellites. The moon beasts in the Dream Quest actually enslave the men of language as well, which are mildly interesting, but probably not intentionally relevant. Chambers invented the King in Yellow, which Lovecraft borrowed, often interpreted as the High priest not to be described in the Lang Monastery, and for what little it is worth, the Qinlin are mythologically associated with the Yellow Emperor historically in China. There's reasonable odds the stained stone altars thrown in hideous frescoes in the dark shrine come from the nameless monastery of Lang with the high priest not to be described. The throne in the dark shrine actually says it may have once been used by some malevolent high priest. The tapestry in there depicts the foul black fluid poured from urns onto the altar. There are also urns next to the underground exit of the Lang Monastery. It comes out from a high perpendicular cliff of basalt, which is much like the Broken Land situation. And I should mention that when Carter exits Lang's hateful monastery down through the darkness, he rules out going further down so as to avoid having to go back up through Koth. Recall that both Koth and Lang's monastery are next to the vaults of Zin. As Carter shoved a merchant into the deep pit leading to Zin just before he fled the monastery. So that is the geographical proximity of the scenes of the Dreamlands, even though they happen at different times in the story. And it would explain the dark shrine in that spot. The night gods flew Carter a long way underground earlier in the story from the mountain at Granik, so that helps orient how far under the Dreamland surface the vaults of Zin actually reach, but it is under both the Enchanted Wood and the Plateau of Lang. But enough of that context tangent. Back to the Silver Key. Carter goes through another unconscious ritual with his antique Silver Key while looking into the light of the Quasi-Sphere. This causes another titanic arch to appear, not unlike what was in the cave within a cave in the Snake Den. He floats through that ultimate gate to encounter Yog sothoth the guardian and key of forbidden knowledge, who exists outside of time and space. Yog sothoth allows Carter to pass through, arriving on the alien world of Yadith millions of years in the past, but he is reincarnated in the body of an alien wizard from that world. He has to eventually figure out how to send himself back to Earth through space to the right time while suppressing the alien personality because he needs a parchment written in Reliayan to go back the other way to regain his human body, which is actually just a translation of the Hyperborean original, which comes from Clark Ashton Smith, Sothagua stuff. Carter absentmindedly forgot to bring the parchment with him, leaving it behind in his car in the key's hideously carbon box. He had found it in the attic in the earlier Silver Key story in the back of a drawer in a tall chest. That might motivate the armoire in the monastery gallery, which is made of expensive materials, though that's a stretch. There isn't enough specific detail. 
But then, after explaining the parchment and the whole situation, his older cousin Aspinwall gets fed up and, accusing the Hindu Swami of being a charlatan, gets mad and shouts some racist slurs at him, pulls at the Swami's bearded face and discovers to his horror that it's just a waxen mask and that there's an alien underneath, which is now the body of Randolph Carter. But the alien consciousness reasserts itself and takes off through a door. So... The first thing I will point out is that the Dark Shrine is in the shape of an antique key. This could refer to the Forbidden Key of the Void in the Shadow World context, which I will address in the Death Symbolism segment, but it's effortlessly explained by this story. The parchment in Through the Gates of the Silver Key also has hieroglyphs on it, which is writing in the dead language of Relier, which is analogous to our modified Eureric glossary, where ancient Eureric was written in hieroglyphics. Relier is the sunken city where dead Cthulhu sleeps and waits dreaming. Then we have the snake's den. Recall that there are rat snakes under the monastery. You have to pass by a waterfall to go into the snake's den cave. And at the back of, the, of this cave, there's another cave, a dripping grotto with a wall that looks like a monstrous and consciously shaped pylon. If you look at how the gateway is described in Through the Gates of the Silver Key, there appears to be a gigantic sculptured stone hand above this pylon, called an imagined arch, in other words, a gateway, where in gemstone we have a finger-shaped boulders on both sides of the portal, and a stone ring spinning around its blackness. The nature of the snake den gateway is that the key makes you almost unconsciously go through ritual motions and intonations, and then you dematerialize, physically vanishing from the space and time out of thin air which is exactly what happens when you read the runes in the Mystic Chamber. There's also dizzying language involved, which matches up. You do not get any first-person messaging about what you're doing to make it happen, but in the third person, you throw your arms out and chant. When Carter does this, he is crossing the barrier to the untrammeled land of his dreams and the gulfs where all dimensions dissolve in the absolute. So we still have this theme of the land of dreams. Now, what does this all mean? For one thing, it is implying that you are vanishing from this reality, consistent with the backstory. For another thing, it wrecks any absolute notion of past, future, and present. So the chronology issues we've discussed go out the window, in terms of logically excluding anachronisms. And most fascinatingly, it implies that when you vanish in this way, there is a quasi-sphere on the other side, which can take you through an ultimate gateway, which will allow you to be transmogrified into other kinds of entities, however alien. And these monsters, in a very cosmic sense, are other versions of yourself. So if the Crystal Dome is the analog of this quasi-sphere, you can transform souls into alien or extraplanar entities, which can give a really dark and malevolent significance to the phrase spirit born of death, fitting naturally with this notion of fashioning the great demons. It is essentially an unnatural form of immortality. If you look at the text of Through the Gates of the Silver Key, when this transformation happens to Carter, you will see that it has remarkable similarities to parts of the old spirit death messaging, or I should say the decay messaging in general, whenever there is soul departure. Earlier when it talks about oblivion, there is a certain resemblance as well. It is interesting that the ultimate gate forms from Carter staring into the light of the quasi-sphere because piercing gaze is one of the only spells that work on the crystal dome. So maybe the only other spell that I know works on it, phase, is not about entering a control room when it's off, but rather about entering a gateway. So let's back up a minute. When we allow Lovecraftian horror as a subtext, that does weird and strange things to our boundaries on consistency. For one thing, being influenced by esotericism and the occult as it is, his stories are paranormal. There are unnatural ways of knowing things and various kinds of impossibilities. These are more like paradoxes than actual impossibilities, because the horror is in the explanation for them. In fact, things being impossible, incomprehensibly inconsistent according to what is rational and normal, is itself a Lovecraftian horror motif, something he does relatively often. For example, if something from the wrong time period is found in an impossibly different time period, that is Lovecraftian horror. The Shadow of Time is one such case where the narrator finds modern writing in his own handwriting, sealed up underground in stone runes in Western Australia, which are millions of years old. 
The horror is that this is an impossible anachronism and proves what happened to him. In this case, it's because there's an ancient race of telepaths, the Yith, who can swap their consciousness with the minds of other races in the far distant future, causing knowledge of the past and future. They would know their own deaths in advance and transfer bodies into future hosts. So people in the future die in the past trapped inside an alien body, one variation of Lovecraft's body horror motif, buried alive in another body. The people who have hosted the Yith before have dreams of other times and remember things have not happened yet. Interestingly, after the fall of man, mankind will be replaced by a civilization of beetles, which could be an interesting motivation for the giant fog beetles. Who knows? It's a one-off. The Yith, by the way, wrote the narcotic manuscripts, which could motivate the Punterican in the Broken Land backstory. Those millions of years old ruins in Western Australia were their city, Nakatis, which was known for its great library of knowledge across time. I don't know if any of those P's should be read as silent, but that might be a hint for the language anachronism. Or you might have something like the cultists in the Call of Cthulhu, who have their own unnatural way of knowing things. Cults from different regions of the world with no connection with each other at all. All know this ritual chant in the dead relaying language about Cthulhu. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. It means, in his house at Reliate, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. Because they acquire their knowledge of it subconsciously in dreams, which, by the way, resembles the Orgiana stanza in the Temple of Darkness poem, Repose and Silent Waiting. Since Cthulhu is dreaming and sleeping death, their minds come into contact with Cthulhu in dreams. And the Silver Key stories allow both time travel and transtemporal knowledge, making use of that dead language of Relier. In fact, Yog Sothoth transcends time itself, the whole point of that story. When you start allowing premises like these, there is no way to be sure you are dating the Dark Shrine correctly. The Temple of Darkness can have the same poem without any contact or sharing of information. The dead gods they worship do not need to ever be present for either, or they might always be present in some kind of weird way. What about shared esoteric subtexts? And through the gates of the Silver Key, we have this very weird scene where Carter has transcended his physical body outside time and space. You have all this language about the all-in-one, that physical manifestations of time are just instances of archetypal ideas. That is essentially what is called Neoplatonism, Western esotericism along the lines of the Theosophical Society, ideas about astral projection, where you have a spirit body and other planes of existence. I'm wording all that very loosely. But it is what the word esoteric means in Lovecraft stories. It's not just an adjective meaning the specialized knowledge of experts. So you have similar Eastern ideas, not coincidentally, such as in Tantric Yoga esotericism with Hinduism. Yoga first originates in the Katha Upanishad, which is a reasonable enough guess for the basis of Uthex Kathiasis, though Kadath could also be a basis for Kathiasis. That kind of speculation is treacherous. Recall the story speaks of Yogi and has a supposed Hindu Swami as its narrator. The idea there is that you have a subtle body or spirit or astral body. The chakras along the body are the focal points in that concept. Subtle bodies have their own associated planes of existence, though the Lovecraft stories have no chakra in them. So you have what is apparently one of the chakras in the monastery in the top-level meditation chamber, and the monastery has a portal where the physical body vanishes into some other plane of existence. There is, I think, a fairly clear consonance of esoteric subtext in these details. Is not just the Lovecraft story. The chakra is taking it one step further. Esotericism as a theme could be present in any number of ways. For example, the inexplicable correspondences between the two sides of the mystic chamber are esoteric, whether they are physical or symbolic, similar to the kind of macrocosm and microcosm represented by the archetypes outside of time in the Lovecraft story. So it's the notion of self-transformation and gnosis, immediate apprehension of the cosmic. Western esotericism mixes hermeticism, gnosticism, neoplatonism, and so on. With Plato himself, you have the allegory of the cave, where what we perceive are like shadows on the wall of a cave, rather than what really exists in our ideal true forms. 
philosophy for Plato is about the higher reality. Then in Neoplatonism, you have the notion of everything in reality is an emanation of the one, which is what you see with Yogg-Sothoth in Through the Gates of the Silver Key. You know, it's interesting here to take Plato literally interpreting our huge cavern that way. The dark vortices is the shadows on the wall, so to speak, an allegory of the allegory of the cave, along with Plato's analogy of the sun, which is about understanding reality with the mind, lacking goodness being analogous to lacking the light of the sun, and the analogy of the dividing line, which is about different levels of understood reality, which you can read into the stream dividing the cavern. Or due to the chaining light levels, the dark vortices coming down the stairway fall apart if they cross a stream. It would be a really big stretch to imagine that was actually intentional. But the dark vortices are not in the Dreamland's underworld. They may or may not be on the way up and cut off stairs. There are other ways to get black vortices or other kinds of vortices out of Lovecraft stories if you go looking for them. Like when looking into the shining trapezohedron, another transdimensional almost sphere of forbidden knowledge, which remarkably resembles the polished paneled crystal dome. There are vortices of black mist. The shining trapezohedron is a window on all of time and space. It summons an avatar of Nyarlathotep. Actually, I should stop for a minute and talk about the shining trapezohedron from Lovecraft's The Haunter of the Dark. Sacrifices are made to it by a group of cultists in Rhode Island, the Starry Wisdom Cult, so that the Avatar will reveal other worlds and forbidden arcane knowledge to them. Nyarlathotep, of course, only gives madness to the presumptuous. It will not turn out well for you if you summon him. The Shining Trapezohedron is not from this world. It came from the Agoth and was once possessed by the Elder Things. It seems because of the ending to be giving a glimpse into the mind of Yogg-Sothoth. This makes the main character go utterly mad, Robert Blake. No, not that, Robert Blake. Who's based on the horror writer Robert Block. The Haunter of the Dark is the name of that particular avatar for Nyarlathotep. In the Dream Quest, he's instead called the Crawling Chaos. Robert Block wrote a sequel to The Hunter called The Shadow from the Steeple. The Hitchcock movie Psycho, by the way, was based on a Robert Block story. Lovecraft and Block were writing these stories back and forth, killing each other off through certain characters. One of the other things that the narrator sees when he was looking through the shining trapezohedric crystal was a procession of roped hooded figures whose outlines were not human. Hooded figures, that exact wording. But the trapezohedron causes possession by an Arlatotep caused by staring into it and the darkness. And it resembles the crystal dome, though much smaller. This is all very much a multi-author complication if you go past Lovecraft himself into the extended Lovecraft mythos. In Stephen King books, he has Nyarlathotep show up in the form of evil characters like Randall Flagg. In the Graveyard series, I argued that Bander Atrevion was our Nyarlathotep analog, where Kadena would be Yogg-Sothoth and Azatoth is the unlife. But here I was trying to talk about Black Vortices. There are also black vortices in an Arlatotep story called The Dreams in the Witch House. That story involves having dream visions of alien and disturbing otherworldly vistas. The Cyclopean stairs of Kadath, as I said, have shadows and vortices of cold wind, though the broken land stairs are not Cyclopean. That refers to huge stone blocks fitted together without mortar, but the dark grotto is all rock cut architecture. Something else that is down at the noise level is the cracked brass gong by the altar in Toad Braziers and the Dark Trine. This could allude to the cracked chimes of St. Toad and Fungi from Yagoth, which refers to Sothogula. There is also a Clark Ash and Smith story called The Devotee of Evil, where this obsessed guy has an apparatus of gongs and is trying to find the resonance frequency of pure evil, whose sound causes columns of darkness to form and the guy ends up transforming into a black statue compared to Satan frozen in Dante's Inferno. There's a thin outside chance it could inspire some of the dark shrines, such as the Morku statue. But we were talking about stuff that is down at the level of coincidence. Supposing the extreme possibility were actually true that the statue of Morku is really Morku himself sleeping like Cthulhu, that could come from the horror in the museum, where another great old one is mistaken for a wax sculpture. That's also the name of the Lovecraft co-author or ghostwriting anthology that was published in 1989. 
the anthology that was the first book to include the full version of the Mound story. Earlier I said the McGrew do not strongly correspond to the Dream Quest monsters, but that they are convincingly similar to Lovecraft's Shoggoths. The Shoggoths as an analogy is also interesting because of the way they are used in At the Mountains of Madness. It has more of a science fiction story, an expedition into Antarctica, where at one point it talks about the Plateau of Lang and Kadath in the Cold Waste being in a mountain range there. That is the Waking World, our universe, versions of those dreamland places. Waking World is the term for our dimension in the Dream Quest. If you've ever watched The Thing, which is based on a story by a different author, it's a similar kind of situation. In the Mountains of Madness, there are ruins of an ancient city belonging to the Elder Things. This is the race that the Yith Telepaths I mentioned earlier were fleeing from. The Elder Things invented the Shoggoths, essentially cellular blobs, to perform labor for them. This was responsible for the artificial origins of life on the world. They were entities made to take any form and perform any task. The Shoggoths ended up becoming independent and largely caused the downfall of the Elder Things. So the expedition accidentally wakes up a Shoggoth, which was bad. There were also blind six-foot-tall penguins, apparently having been used as livestock, which is slightly reminiscent of the Nickley and probably being enlarged forms of the cavern lizards. But as an allegory, this can play into the lords of essence as the ancient race, which had done all sorts of experimentation with making artificial life, and Kadena and her minions making monsters out of them. Waking World Kadath instead of Dreamland Kadath. There was some great horror out in the mountains. By the way, this story is another example of Lovecraft doing impossible anachronisms as a horror motif. The expedition was finding fossils with features that were way too early to evolve, as well as Cambrian fossils that apparently had been using tools. So it is entirely possible Kygar intended the writing on the Dark Shrine to be a seemingly impossible anachronism that was made back in the first era or somehow made by something from the first era later, and the reason for it is Lovecraftian horror. We may have to seriously consider Morgu having an unconventional presence in the Broken Land, where he might be present in multiple time periods without it being a contradiction. For example, if he hibernates like his Gagor, cultists can worship him as an idol, and when he wakes up later, seeing stuff has been done in his lair, he can get angry and smash the things around him. Morgu, interestingly, was a brawler like Kay. For what it's worth, back in 2000, Veravese said on the forums that if you want to understand Marlu, then you should read The Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> His Urglace Talismans from Hunt for History also had a Lovecraftian war song. By the way, if anyone has one of those, I will buy it off you. Before moving on, I want to point out a few parallels to various Lovecraft stories, which might have influenced the wording in some rooms. The confidence we can have for these not being coincidences is much lower. You can pause the video to compare the quoted paragraphs. There's another story called The Statement of Randolph Carter, referring to Carter's frail nerves, with wet stone steps leading into the earth, with moist walls with green nicker, which might inspire some of the other misty chamber wording, as well as the dangerous wetness of the hidden stairway down there. The misty chamber is probably causing the condensation. Greater essence focus effects in Shadow World because of the major portal, which incidentally is a reason Morgul would avoid it, since he hates rain and moving water. Both sides have a damp mist. There is that other Nyarlathotep story where the narrator is threatened with being brought to Azatoth, called the Dreams in the Witch House. One of its vistas might inspire the jagged plain landscape, including the forest of crystals and the fog. The story also has its own spiral of black vortices and mud monster footprints, which would be consistent with the horrid interpretation of the mud sea. The Azatoth poem in Fungi from Yagoth happens to have shapeless bad things and idiot vortices. The vestry and crumbling library in the Dark Shrine could come from the Haunter of the Dark. The library could also be influenced by Lovecraft's The Evil Clergyman, where an evil priest burns all of their own magical books. The rule having wings that look like they are not large or strong enough to support flight may refer to the Call of Cthulhu, where Cthulhu only has rudimentary narrow wings, because their background lore is Gagora has them sleeping for millennia. 
the apocalyptic juggernaut and the Crystal Dome explosion messaging could come from a Nyarlathotep and Yonk Sotha story called The Last Test. It was in the context of mad ranting about knowledge at any cost, including killing and worshipping the ineffable light in Yonk Sotha. This is from a great man, a scientist researcher who started by trying to help humanity, but became monomaniacal and evil corrupted by Atlantean cultists and eldritch ancient knowledge of elder races, like our Uthex. But this is an obscure story, one of those ones Lovecraft rewrote for other writers. It was also in that anthology, the horror in the museum and other revisions. It's the only story where Lovecraft uses the word juggernaut. By the way, Lovecraft was using juggernaut in the figurative way it was in the 19th century, not how we modernly use it. It is usually used today to refer to an unstoppable machine or overwhelming force, like the X-Men villain. But its older usage meant something demanding blind devotion and merciless sacrifice. The word comes from the Hindu god Jagannatha, a title for Krishna, who is the supreme god in tantric traditions. The Western version of Jagannatha comes from a medieval Franciscan monk who was describing Hindus crushing themselves to death under the wheels of huge chariots bearing the black and red idol of the god Jagannatha, who was the epitome of idolatry to 19th century missionaries. This is worth mentioning given other indications that etymology matters in the Broken Land Associated areas. These details could be relevant to the esoteric and Lovecraftian interpretations of the Crystal Dome. The explosion has the straightforward meaning, but it might also have this other meaning. And lastly, the chunks of rock falling from the sky could maybe be influenced by the meteor and the color of space. You would relate the broken land fog to the vapors in that story, which is a huge stretch. But we can get eerie vista fog on that terrain from the witch house story. But at that point, you're really reaching down to the noise level of coincidences. The more interesting theme from that story could be the meteor bringing an alien life form with it, which in turn ends up annihilating the natural ecology of the surrounding environment. Say the comet saw Cain, which passes very close and opens rifts and flow storms. It was responsible for opening the dormant Koron portals for the dark gods. And maybe in this parallel dimension, saw Cain crashed into the world, or that this is Koron in that parallel dimension and passed so close that it hit the moon, opening portals here to the chaos planes as well. One might imagine the Maru riding such an impactor, all the other stuff is downstream consequences which is something I will look at more closely later. Weird ecology as intentional. Remember, the McGrew are immune to heat, so the heat of entry would not kill them. Maybe this would have something to do with why only blunt impact works on them. The alien in the color out of space was also in the form of strange colors, which is a theme in the Broken Land with the Miklian and the Crystal Dome. What does all of this have to do with death and gemstone? Well, in episodes four and five of my graveyard series, I argue that the purgatory soul departure messaging is partly based on Lovecraft. Some of the language, the creeping eternity and doom and hopelessness and other parts, mirror the end of the dream quest. You can compare the color-coded pointer arrows between these excerpts of them. Similarly, deep under the graveyard, you have a purgatory throne room and a steep shaft where you almost fall into the darkness, where the room painting down there has wording in it that parallels parts of the purgatory messaging. Likewise, the world of your memories rushing back to you and so on, which is part of the messaging that was removed around 2004. The graveyard is roughly as old as the death mechanics. Other parts, such as the scorching of reincarnation and seeing many others around you in oblivion, may come from the yogg Sothoth scene in Through the Gates of the Silver Key, which is the same protagonist as the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. I went over all this in depth in my graveyard series. I also argue that Oblivion and Lovecraft's dream cycle stories, most clearly described in his prose poem, Ex Oblivion, where all memory and identity wash away when you cross through the final gateway, tightly matches what actually happened upon permanent character death. That all of the language indicated purgatory is on the other side of the gates of Oblivion, and that it is experienced as a literal Oblivion state of near unconsciousness and unawareness. It is purgatory because it is between the sorting into light and darkness. There is nothing about that in Shadow World. 
Shadow World in 1989 did not define what was on the other side of the gates of oblivion, only that it was a portal to another dimension that was guarded by the goddess Iyssa. This is how the creators of Gemstone 3 went with it in 1989 or 1990. So, what is the allegorical significance of the Broken Land paralleling the underworld of the dream quest of Unknown Kadath and the projection into another dimension and through the gates of the Silver Key and possibly other eldritch artifacts like the Shining Trapezohedron? which is itself a window on all of time and space. Well, in my graveyard series, I interpreted Empress Kadena in the Lovecraftian dimension of the story as analogous to yogg Doth, the guardian of forbidden knowledge and transmogrification. Kadena Throckvarok, Kadena guardian of the forbidden. I suggested that she is the guardian of the void, an alternative afterlife of the demonic, which has almost nothing to do with canon shadow world, though it may be adapted from vestigial texts. Does almost all gemstone. Kadena has absolutely nothing to do with death or the afterlife or Issa or the Lords of Orhan and Shadow World source books. The gates of oblivion are all Issa. She is the gatekeeper. There's nothing resembling Gossina. But Kadena seems to be treated as a death goddess in the graveyard, and she is represented next to Issa with her staff of doom. When you look at the Issa documentation in Shadow World back to 1989, she has a number of magical artifacts. Among these are the six keys to the gates of oblivion. Only three were defined in 1989. The keys of life and death are what are used for the gates. Those ones are pretty much self-explanatory. The key never to be used, the forbidden key, is the key of the void, which in the Shadow World context implies the demonic realms. The void is associated with the unlife in early books. This is, I think, the Shadow World's sense of calling Kadena the Guardian of the Forbidden, because the graveyard treats her as some kind of rival death goddess to Yissa, and the books refer to her followers as fashioning great demons. So if we interpret Uthex's new source of power as having the ability to reincarnate souls into monstrous forms, even extra planar forms, perhaps into the demonic, that is entirely consistent with my graveyard theory. It would reflect the theological interpretation of the dark path as a dark mirror of the death religion. Are there additional reasons to think that parallel applies to the broken land? One thing to consider are the hooded figures. These may parallel the men of Lang, who look almost human because their inhuman features are hidden under turbans and clothes. That may well be the case for the hooded figures who appear to be human, but the backstory calls them perverted creations of Uthex. Not just the fell beasts, but the hooded figures. Those I noted earlier, there are actual literal hooded figures who are not human, witnessed in The Haunter of the Dark. And there's a procession of hooded black robed priests who may not be human in the temple at Inganok in the Dream Quest. The men of Lang, by the way, fought with neighboring bloated spiders, which are not in the Broken Land, but the hooded figures and giant fog beetles do attack each other, though I do not know with certainty if they always did. We might also notice that the hooded figures spawn in the bright flash, which might be implying the Crystal Dome is recycling their souls. But most importantly, if we look in the Landing Temple, which I argued is paralleled in various ways in the graveyard, the temple acolytes involved with the tapestry and deed ceremony are called hooded figures. So if you follow through on that premise, you go up to the Dark Shrine. The secret room behind the tapestry where the rule urns is akin to the storage room for the deed sacrifices. The altar is the analog of the altar and the deed ceremony for presenting sacrifices. In this case, you are sacrificing life instead of acquiring credits for more life. The long corridor will be the analog of the hall of sacrifice with the dais with the old priest. The tapestry, of course, is the analog of the tapestry. The black robes the sacrifice tapestry depicts are analogous to the black robes of the high priestess in the deed ceremony. The toad brazier is the analog of the brazier that flares to signal whether the sacrifice is accepted by the goddess. And the cracked brass gong is the analog of the brass chimes to ring in the deed ceremony. The altar bells rung three times in Eucharist ceremonies, like in the deed ceremony. In the graveyard series, I argue the deed ceremony parallels medieval rituals, that purgatory as such is a medieval Roman Catholic concept, and we have seen a bunch of medieval Catholicism. I made an argument that deeds and purgatory were medieval homage, and the theocracy of Kadena analog of homage is thraldom. So this shrine is maybe illustrating the genteel facades of prayer 
engaged in by the Dark Path theocracy, which again was done with rosaries, which are a Catholic veneration of the Holy Mother. Whereas in the Temple of Darkness poem, we have this unholy Mother of Darkness. Clever, you might say, or maybe generic and only coincidences. What else would this have to do with the Dark Gods? If we go with the legend of the Necropolis of Atrium's premise that Empress Cadena was the first of some number of gods to follow the unlife, we can reinterpret that as the Dark Lords of Koron from 1990 onward, that her idea of a fit environment for the world was a land tortured with earthquakes and flows of lava. Then we make note of the fact that the Gates of Oblivion are portal located on the moon Orhan. It is in the forest garden where the River of Life meets the Spring of Youth which, if you wanted to push it, could be read into the geysers, and perhaps the stream and pool in the fungus forest, though, as I said, that is pushing it. So if we have another kind of gateway leading to another kind of reincarnation associated with darkness, we have it in a place associated with Corona, instead of the gates of oblivion, which are on the surface of Oron, but it is not necessarily the moon Corona itself. That would be too easy. By leaning into the same fictional allegory as death messaging, it can be another plane of existence, analogous to what purgatory is through the gates of oblivion, because we've already gone through a portal to get there, and by the backstory for it, we are already on some other plane of existence. It is not the final destination, but the halfway point between the possibilities of reincarnation. Returning from the broken land to the misty chamber is actually literally reincarnation, because your physical body is dematerialized from this plane of existence. There's just this potential for being reincarnated into other forms. In that way, it would entirely make sense for the Broken Land to correspond to the otherworldly scenes in those same Lovecraft stories. And we have a lot of hidden meaning encoded into this cryptic phrase, spirit born of death. Remember what the reincarnation altar in the Landing Temple says above it, all things begin and end here. One question that remains is if Dante matters significantly to the Broken Land given how prominently it related to the graveyard and purgatory. There have been hints in that direction in this episode, but nothing substantive, no obvious literal parallel in the same way. If we think of this allegorical emphasis on the dreamland's underworld as figurative and symbolic instead of literal, and that the ascent up the dark shrine is like an inversion of climbing up Dante's Mount Purgatory, then what we might have is the fall of Satan in Inferno turned on its head. Instead of being frozen in a deep pit caused by the fall of Satan, which in turn formed the mountain purgatory, we may have a hollow mountain where, at the top of it, we have a frozen or immobilized satanic morgu at its peak. That would be fantastic. But by looking at the broken land from a different point of view, this might be more plausible than it sounds on first blush. And the moon interpretation gets even weaker, as we will see in a moment by taking something else about the Broken Land more seriously. That is the bulk of the literary subtext of the Broken Land, notwithstanding more of the same stuff. But something else I wanted to look at more closely, with respect to the notion of internal consistency, is the extent to which things are supposed to make sense physically, that is, materialistically or scientifically. The Broken Land rooms stand out for making use of different sensory stimuli to convey meaning. It's not just sight. It is also touch, smell, taste, and hearing, which suggests things are supposed to make sense that way. How real is all this supposed to be? Because we have this occult, esoteric kind of stuff, but we also have Uthex as the researcher with probably ancient Lord of Essence technology. If the Broken Land is a parallel material dimension, it should follow essentially the same physics as Kalthea. But if it is some kind of dream dimension, like in those Lovecraft stories, that is a lot less clear. Those dimensions are apparently material with sensory stimuli, but only up to a point, because you can do things like sail on ships to the moon. So let's assume it's supposed to be physically realistic, consistent with all the normal physics, though acknowledging that an author trying to do that might make unintentional oversights. Some things jump out from allowing that assumption. What if it were the moon corona? Those Gagora would not be able to fly under normal gravity. But if it were the gravity under Corone, their wings are probably good enough. Corone was most likely a captured asteroid. It is thick ice covering rock and has a highly eccentric processing orbit. 
if it's anywhere on Crone, those mountains are likely artificial, though dwarf plants like very large asteroids do have mountains. The IAU dwarf plant classification did not exist in 1994, so the better word for it would be planetoid. It is difficult to speculate on what is impossible for exotic worlds. Most do not have plate tectonics for mountain formation, but let's play devil's advocate with it. Very large impact craters on asteroids and moons are able to disrupt the crust and form tall mountains, including on the far antipodal side of it, like the mountain of Purgatory in Dante, which was formed by the fall of Satan on the opposite side of the Earth. That is very literal when playing the devil's advocate. That's something we'll have to take seriously, but if the broken land is related to the Purgatory death mechanics allegorically, and is related to the graveyard story, which was apparently partly made into a direct parallel of Dante's Inferno, then it might well be the case that Crone is used in the Broken Land to play off Inferno's ferryman. And this would all symbolize the fall of Satan, who is frozen at the center of the Earth. And the literal parallel for the Broken Land is the underworld of the Dreamlands, where the Satan analog being near the mountain peak is backwards. But that's how it is with Nyarlathotep, the fallen archangel at the end scene of the Dream Quest. So we have this apparent black mass stuff happening in the Dark Shrine, and Morgu, who most closely physically resembles Satan. That is, Satan as portrayed in Dante's Inferno, which could even support the very radical conjecture that the huge statue in the Dark Shrine is really Morgu himself, which might explain all the smashed stone and physical damage in the Dark Shrine if he ever woke up mad. Whether he is sleeping or was immobilized that way by the Lords of Orhan is less clear. We see them in prison dark gods in New York, Eog, and Demons of the Burning Night. But Morgu may be present there in very long cycles of dormancy, dating back, perhaps, all the way to the First Era. Much like the Gagor themselves in their jars. And that wreak hell on our trying to historically date the Age of the Dark Shrine the seemingly ancient Eurarch being expressed with the modern Fanatic alphabet and knowledge of Third Era conditions in the Temple of Darkness poem, would cease to be paradoxes at all, including Uthek's working there and the unlife cultists dealing with Morgu in the Second Era, with Morgu getting stuck there after the Wars of Dominion. This could also be an esoteric parallel of Vander frozen underneath the graveyard, because there's nothing like it in or around the monastery. You can't go up the rock slide in the Seofar Strake which could be a very interesting twist if those dark priests in the Dark Shrine were Dark Path cultists from Banner's Theocracy to Empress Kadena. That'd be an incredibly cool way of tying it all together. But digression aside, if this is all an impact basin, we would have to toss out the underground theory. And it would give a very literal meaning to the broken land. It really only needs to be underground if this is supposed to be the Moon Corona for various reasons mentioned, such as containing the atmosphere. Mountains forming within caves makes no sense, tectonically speaking. Now, underground mountains are actually real, but they are not like what we see in the broken land. They are more like a rugged lack of smoothness at the boundary of rock layers. The maximum height of a world's mountains is also limited by its gravity, for various reasons related to being too heavy to be supported. Much the same reason why large asteroids become spheres. The Broken Land Mountains are described as jagged and are apparently lacking in liquid erosion. Though I say that with an asterisk, there is absolutely ice melt dripping inside them. There are large boulders that either fell from the sky above or else are cleaved from the mountains, likely from frost cracking. That is, the condensed steam quickly freezes and falls, which eventually fractures the rocks way high up. Then you have to wonder if the dragon plane is just boulders falling off the mountains. And the chunks of rock falling from the sky are not meteors or a cavern roof, but these high vertical mountains cracking and rolling off rocks, which would give its own meaning to the phrase broken land. The roughly circular pattern would be because of how the cliff curves on the west end. So when they fall off randomly to some distance, the debris field is circular. The mountains remain looking jagged, and the crystal dome is unharmed. The height of the debris may just not be enough to bury the dome. These certainly do not sound like dead stratovolcanoes, which form from plate tectonics anyway. The volcanic heating under Crone is probably because of tidal forces between it, Colthea, 
and smaller targets from the other shadow world moons, much in the same way as Jupiter's moon Io, which does have calderas, volcanic sinkholes, essentially, when you have a collapsed eruption. The mountains of Io just jut up from the ground in isolation from other mountains because there are no plate tectonics to form mountain ranges. But they do have this kind of jaggedness, uplifted crust from thrust faults. So you get sheer cliff walls of gargantuan heights. These were seen by the Voyager probes back in 1979, so we can entertain those notions as possible. And you can imagine, fantastically, there may be being huge hollows within crusts and these jagged crust protrusions becoming thrust up within them, assuming we keep this literal peaks of Throck you can see, though I do not think it is plausible. For it to be under Krohn, I had argued it would need to be underground with an artificial gravity field with probably terraforming mountains. If it is instead the surface on a parallel dimension, it would not even need to be underground at all. Call lightning not working there originally might have some other reason behind it. Like it might be that there isn't enough atmospheric moisture to support it. Similar to how Call Familiar has no animals to call upon, which could tie into the whole Morgul hating water thing, not residing in a place where there is rain. Which makes you wonder when the boiling sea of mud formed relative to the Morgul's layer. It might have been just fine and dandy for him at earlier times. Maybe the dome was used in the first era and then was dormant in the interregnum until near the end of the second era with Uthax and the cultists, and has been mostly left turned on for 6,000 years. This kind of landscape is associated with Morgu and Canon. Morgu has humanish orc-like worshippers in Emer called Charn Raiders, who live in a similar wasteland. Those were bred by the Lords of Essence for some unknown purpose in the First Era, more able to survive in bright sunlight than the probably related orcs. I doubt the Charn Plateau is relevant, but who knows. It's the only bit of background lore from Morgu outside of his Dark Spirit entry having these bestial worshippers bred from Lord of Essence experiments. They live in caverns, honeycombing the rocky Charn Plateau, and are a bit like the Tuscan Raiders from Star Wars, though that's the surface of Kalthea, and their plateau is not volcanic. Volcanism on Corona is supposed to be subterranean, but tidal volcanism for Corona is not explicitly stated, and it might not be right. It might be volcanic because of flow storms and essence disruptions. Though I think that ought to only be true on Kalthea because Kalthea happens to have magma in the first place. Either way, that is just internal heating. Mountains formed from tidal heating do not look like those formed from plate tectonics. And the idea of plate tectonics existing on Corona is extremely dubious. There's a lot of variation in asteroid geology, but not that kind of variation. However, these exotic excuses for saving the moon interpretation run into still other problems even if we allow the mountain formation. There are some reasons to think there is a lot of limestone in the broken land, which I will get to. It makes no geological sense at all for limestone to exist on the moon Corona. The rock itself would have to be artificial, not just terraforming into new shapes. That would be a really big hit to the moon interpretation, unless it's some weird parallel dimension version. Some of the called Fang Mountains are volcanic, so the monastery has a hot spring inside it. The broken land side has a rare kind of hot spring called geysers. This involves tubes seeping deep into the crust, reaching magma or hot igneous rock, and there's an eruption as long as the temperature is above boiling. This happens because the water turns to steam and then jets out, splashing up water with it. The sea of mud, notably, is boiling. Geysers are rare because the magma has to be relatively close to the surface, and it requires plumbing in the rocks. There are two kinds of geysers. Steady pluming geysers like Old Faithful and Yellowstone are cone geysers. Intense bursts out of pools are called fountain geysers. These are fountain geysers. Well, technically, there are also ice geysers on icy moons. That wasn't discovered until, I think, 2005. But there's also something more subtle about this, because that's not the only geological concept present. There's another type of hot spring called a mud pool or mud pot, which typically bubble up to a few feet. These are highly acidic, so even if they were not hot, it would still burn your skin. 
is because they form sulfuric acid, which as you will see is a recurring motif. The color of the boiling mud sea is consistent with a real world mud pool, but fountain geysers in a huge mud pool is very unusual. Mud pools form where water is in short supply. However, the scale of this is more like a very large mud volcano, which can be miles wide and formed from tectonic pressures pushing up fluidized sediments. But this is clearly much hotter than that, indicating magma. And there did used to be a mud geyser at Yellowstone. That could spray mud up to, say, 50 feet in the air back in the 1800s. It does not do it now. So this is a really obscure geological phenomenon and a very rare combination. It would seem that in the broken land, you have a kind of weird geothermal hydrological cycle with steam eruptions, snow condensation, ice melt, and water back into the geysers, quite possibly with frost-driven cleaving of boulders which fall almost vertically, the wild-growing crystals which do not feel like a natural geological process. Those, as I said, are probably extraplanar entities called crystals. I've interpreted the mud targets in each room as horde entities, but maybe that's wrong. Maybe the idea was, say, you cool the mud by casting a mage spell at them, such as 907 Cold Ball or 903 Water Bolt. Or maybe you exacerbate it with fire spells. Or maybe you were supposed to make something happen by casting Boil Earth at it. The mage spell list was implemented through 925 by the beginning of 1992. Those are all possible for it. And then that disrupts some geothermal plumbing process which does something to the dome. There isn't enough information left to speculate about it. Figuring out a puzzle is one thing, even doing it blindfolded. Doing it when it's not even there is another thing entirely. It's entirely possible the missing dome puzzle had messaging that would have clarified things. And what if the crystals are supposed to be a geological process? Well, it would be very weird, but there's weird geology. Strictly speaking, crystals do grow very slowly. They are formed through a nucleation process. If the ionic conditions are just right, you can get mega crystals. Look, for example, at this image from Nayaka, Mexico. This is an area where a mountain formed from magmatic conditions, introducing hot water with a lot of calcium sulfate. Above 58 degrees Celsius, it is solid and hydrate. So then it slowly dips under 58 degrees and it stays barely supersaturated and grows mega crystals of gypsum. So I'm mentioning this not only because of the wildly growing forest of crystals, but because there are crystal spires inside the huge cavern. I have been calling the spire in there stalagmites and some of them are called tall stone spires, but the word stalagmite is never actually used in the huge cavern unlike the puzzle for getting into Uthex's abode, which also refers to stalactites, which come down from the ceiling and notes an actual geological property of them, it is almost touching the stalagmite because they both grow until they merge into columns. The mere fact of stating this shows the concept is geologically informed, though that is very dubious here because these are a trick mechanism built over 6,000 years ago. You're also not supposed to touch speleotherms, by the way, because of your skin oil. It will discolor the rocks and eventually distort their growth. The mechanism is kind of backwards in that way too. So we have a seemingly natural geological formation there that is actually artificial, which is a theme we see really overtly implied in the dark grotto room painting. But we do not see the huge cavern ceiling, and stalagmite is not used. Some of these tall spires are actually called crystals. It's stone and crystal distinctly. The difference between them, chemically speaking, is that a stalagmite is typically polycrystalline and made of calcium carbonate, while a megacrystal is gypsum, a single organ structure with faceted surfaces made from calcium sulfate. Mixing the two together, crystals and stalagmites, might suggest knowing that, or at least something along those lines. You can also have translucent and colorless spirals of pure crystalline calcium carbonate so it doesn't have to be gypsum. One thing to note here is that if the huge cavern is a parallel to the huge cavern next to the monastery, then with the exception of the dark sand right next to the hot spring water, the floor of the whole cavern is actually made of white sand. 
which continentally is typically made of white quartz. But next to the oceans, it can be calcium carbonate. Circle that and put a question mark over it. It's an important difference also because quartz is formed in environments with geothermal water or in igneous rocks as it cools. But here the idea would be it came from the hot spring, which I think is the more likely intent. But as I've said, this is all right next to a limestone plateau. Something else I would point out is that if this plane is some kind of parallel dimension analog of the high plateau, the high plateau is made of limestone and it is limestone caverns that usually produce such stalagmites. Limestone mountains tend to be very dry because if there had been water, it would get acidic with them. And limestone tends to form cliffs in barren desert climates. So that's consistent and more good would like it. The possessed narrator of the Shadow of Time, by the way, visited the limestone caverns in western Virginia. If you really wanted to push it, white sand and limestone are often like bones of the sea for our Vale of Panath parallel, the huge bone pits of the peaks of Thok. But at some point you're reading too much into things. And quartz sand is the more natural explanation. Still, we have this crystal formation. Something else, if we go with this limestone cavern premise, is that we might have some geological wordplay in the Dark Grotto. I've been treating the stone sphere pile and the bone pile as the work of the McGrew, and it certainly is with the bone pit because those are literal bones. But the depression in the room with the spheres may have once been a pool, implying the space could have filled with geothermal water, in which case those 10 inch gray stone spheres are cave pearls, which form like pearls of limestone around mud particles, which would be weird in a chronological sense because this is at elevation and these tunnels were made by the McGrew. But it's a theme of the McGrew that they make seemingly natural geological features that are actually artificial. So they may really be McGrew pearls in origin. Or more outlandishly, the McGrew egg conjecture I mentioned. When you search the McGrew, they will have undissolved gemstones in their jelly, which suggests limestone coating for pearl formation is plausible. We see powdered stone left behind in the dark grotto. Limestone caverns can also have connecting holes in the walls or ceiling called honeycombing or sponge work. And a large collection of these are known as a boneyard, which for us becomes a pun because the dark grotto has a literal boneyard instead of one made from limestone. These are typically formed from sulfuric acid, oxidized hydrogen sulfide. In this view, the caverns are more or less a karst. And the McGrew are macroscopic analogs of the acidophilic organisms that enhance the acid dissolution of the limestone, which grows the caves, which altogether suggest the dark fluid of the McGrew, given the environment, would likely implicitly be based on sulfuric acid. Because even if the electric troglock were based on the Rollmaster absorber entities, the absorbers are acidic, but were not stated to have cave making properties. There is a more exotic possibility worth mentioning given the Uthek story has a built-in theme of meteor strikes. One of the most impressive car systems is in the Yucatan Peninsula, formed on top of the asteroid impact 65 million years ago. The limestone caverns are much more recent. They are called the Ring of Cenotes, so-called because their overall shape is from the underlying impact crater. The Ring of Cenotes was formed only a bit over 100,000 years ago which happens to be the amount of time since the first era. But the Yucatan Peninsula is very flat. The limestone grew on top of it. Like I said earlier, big impacts can form mountains from rock upheaval, so one might imagine the Sea of Mud as an impact crater. Perhaps these mountains were thrust up from displaced limestone. Impact-induced magmatism lasts for a very long time. Because it's remarkable if these are limestone mountains, when limestone is not made from volcanic rock. I'm not like highly convinced that's the intent here. Yucatan's cars are filled with water. You'd also expect a ring on some scale, and it's unclear if these mountains go east, though they may not need to be further east if the impact was to the west, or if the mud sea keeps cutting further up toward the northeast. But the southwest coordinate does not make it sound like the sea mud goes farther to the west. So my gut says the impact should have been somewhere to the southeast. That is, southeast of the part of the plain we can access because of the crystal forest. 
The crystal forest may just be between us and the eastern ring of the crater, and then the eastern mountains are implied by something else. In fact, the eastern ring shape might not be encoded in the jagged plain rooms at all, but instead by the dark grotto. The whole directional trend of the grotto is east from the northwest corner of the jagged plain, and the path extends in a southeast direction, but then it turns and curves southwest. This ends in the room with the cave pearls, which would be the closest to the steam generating boiling sea of mud on the outside, which means the water trip there may have been more vigorous than in the huge cavern, and that increased agitation is what prevented stalagmites from forming. That is, water coming from above rather than through the tunnels, causing the formation of rounded cave pearls instead, assuming they are not really McGrew pearls. But the tunnel path twisting southwest there implies the mountains here are a big ring, starting in the southwest corner of the jagged plain and ending here, so that the crystal forest and plain are really inside the northern half of a huge impact crater. It'd be really cool if it's all a spin-off of that idea. The War Master Meteor Swarm would become a microcosm, macrocosm thing. And if it's a really a sly play on Dante's Inferno, whereas the graveyard was much more literal, but much more symbolic in its Lovecraft. So there may very well be some of these other cases of obscure geological processes being represented in the broken land. There are also huge geodes of gypsum that form, like the pulpy geode found in Spain in 1999. Those crystals must have formed from dripping calcium sulfate, so you could probably grow gypsum spires by dripping. With the broken land in the crystal forest, it is not so clear how a geothermal process could still be growing them. They are translucent white crystals, which would be consistent with being huge gypsum crystals. Gypsum is an evaporite mineral, meaning mineral water evaporates and minerals build up. The mud geysers do not seem to spray that far north in the jagged plain, though that may be refuted to some extent by the mountain snow. The moisture has to be going farther than just the fog. If we were to stretch, maybe the green and orange patches in the mud implied as a gargantuan paint pot from minerals from the surrounding rocks. So if this has calcium in it from limestone and is spraying high into the air, this mineral spray could drift. Then the minerals could land on the nucleations and slowly grow calcium sulfate crystals. Maybe if it was aerosolized instead of coating the crystals in boiling sludge. I do not really buy this physically, but I'm playing devil's advocate. Maybe it's the intent for the crystal formation. The crystals would essentially be pulling your building material out of the air itself sequestering it, much as trees do with carbon dioxide, making them a weird analog of the forest. Meanwhile, there's a barren plain, and it's covered in jacket rocks. The malodorous smell from a mud pot would be hydrogen sulfide, which, as I said, oxidizes and becomes sulfuric acid, so there would be that rotten egg smell all over. But you'd have calcium and sulfur together. It would be in the air and the fog, which would give you gypsum. Though I will say that if this is from limestone, then at some point in the distant past, this whole area had a marine environment. We suggest something cataclysmic happened to the climate, and is reminiscent of the oil painting in the monastery, which depicts the countryside dying during the Wars of Dominion. And if this is a parallel dimension of it, that could be thought of as reflecting an intermediate stage of the transformation. So one might wonder if the crystals formed previously from supersaturated geothermal water rather than later with this low water mud pool evaporite theory. Receded water level inside a gargantuan cavern would be a difficult explanation to solve for the crystal formation, as the crystal dome is explicitly described as clearly a man-made feature, and the crystal forest reaches south of it, leaving this open plain. The one wonders if the crystal dome was made from those crystals. And the sea of mud is boiling, which is too hot. Gypsum forms well below water boiling. So the eastern boundary rooms show the sea of mud stretches off to the east, then you go one north, and the room painting says the crystal forest blocks the way to the east as well. So east of the jagged plain, the crystals reach all the way up to the mud. But with the jagged plain, they have a circular gap, which is approximately centered on the dome. The fog swirling around the dome is likely a greater essence focus effect like with the misty chamber, but it's still remarkable that the fog only reaches up to the rough vicinity around the dome. 
though I suspect that's really just uniform physical distance from the Mud Sea because they both drop off on a northeast-southwest diagonal. The dome may be drawing the fog to itself. As an aside, remember, while the magnetrain of the dome is uniform now, originally it was the highest at the crystal dome and decreased with distance from the dome. So what gives? What you might have is these chunks of rock are only falling on this huge jagged plane part because the meteor swarm way back when damaged a cavern ceiling over that spot or because of the physical proximity to the sheer vertical cliff, which cleaves. It is unclear if rocks are even falling at all on the crystal forest, if falling rocks would sabotage any crystal formation. But maybe the dome itself is preventing it. Maybe the crystal forest does not grow equidistant from the dome itself, because the dome has been growing larger in the same way. It would be draining all the material from the air. Then maybe the fog only reaches up to and around the dome because it's drawing the mineral-rich fog toward itself. And then the crystal forest to the north of that is from when the fog reached farther north. It might even be more concentrated in the south of the plain than farther east. And perhaps this unnatural concentration of moisture is driving the rock cracking higher up. So even if there's a cavern roof, it may be cracking here, but not farther to the east. As I will argue in a minute, the mud may stop boiling farther east. It's an interesting theory. Though to be clear, it takes an extremely long time to build megacrystals naturally, geological timescales, and casting at the crystals was seemingly involved in the puzzle for turning off the dome. So I'm still holding to my extraplanar entity interpretation of it, but perhaps this is meant to be the life cycle concepts, since we have those for the life in the dark grotto. Vitalistic twist on the growing of crystals, establishing a geological relationship between the horde and crystals, where crystals are supposed to be related to earth elementals and role master, and they do share certain transplanar qualities. Or maybe it's only the crystals, and the mud is just representing an earlier life stage. You can't really distinguish those options without the puzzle messaging. So, threading these concepts together, we might say the dome itself is some kind of modified crystal entity. Because of the crystal nature of coexisting in multiplicity, we then have a built-in explanation for how the crystals along the jagged plane were connected to the dome itself. Then if you interpret the fogging effect and the nearby volcanism as being caused by the power concentrating dome, because volcanic activity is caused by essence storms and cloud formation is a symptom of greater essence foci and shadow world, it follows by the internal logic of the situation that turning the power draining dome off could shut off the fog generation next to the jacket plane, even though on the surface it would make no sense that you could turn off that steam, because it would require making the sea of mud stop boiling from underneath, though it might be uh, more mundane, merely not drawing the fog in. Who knows? In which case, the whole geothermal hydrological cycle with frost cracking and crystal formation is being driven by the crystal dome. But I'm not confident I've discerned the exact geological intent of all the broken land crystal stuff. Remember, we are trying to come up with ways to make it all consistent, looking for premises that make sense of everything. Just because we find a slick way to do it, though, doesn't prove that was the authorial intent. What about the Dark Grotto? I mentioned in the second episode that the McGrew are burning their way through the tunnels, and their irreric name means cave makers. And I just suggested it may be macroscopic analogs of karst forming acidophilic microbes. If it's limestone, calcium rock, it's a little interesting that they are piling up bones that have not been dissolved in the bone pit. Maybe they do not like calcium phosphate. Or maybe the collagen in bones is too similar chemically to what they will not eat in the fungus, which I'll explain more a bit later why I think they will not eat it. But I noted that whatever the dark ooze is doing to the cavern rock, they are still producing a soil-like layer of powder. I think this is almost certainly supposed to include dead organic material that was secreted by the McGrew. Similarly, the fungal growth on the spires in the huge cavern, the same principle applies. There ought to be food for the fungus to be growing on it. But there must be something in fungus the McGrew will not eat. The speleotherms would also have a thin layer of water on them. The fungus being on them would distort their growth, so presumably the fungus grew on them later. Something interesting in the McGrew tunnels is that there is a part where it notes you oddly cannot hear echoes. That is, it is explicitly framing that in a tunnel situation like this, 
you should be hearing echoes. So the tunnels are either shaped as an acoustic waveguide or it is the tunnel surfaces. If it is a waveguide redirecting the sound into concentrated echo chambers, that would imply that McGrew tunnels are not actually random. McGrew would be burrowing in that way. Why would they do this? The most obvious answer would be so that they can hear food enter their tunnels from far away, while minimizing any noise pollution from echoes that would get in the way. It would be an acoustic vibration analog of a huge spider web. They would be able to hibernate until woken up by prey. That would be incredibly cool if it was intentional. It could even be their acoustic parallel to the monastery Sumer and various waterworks which would motivate the parallel with the rock piles in the rat snakes. Unfortunately, there's no script in the background actually doing it. The yell verb still only carries from one room in the dark grotto. This isn't fatal. The McGrew may be more sensitive to it. They may sense vibrations instead of visual sight. What if it is tunnel surfaces? Hard surfaces reflect sound. If it is a short distance compared to the speed of sound, we only perceive it as a reverberation, not an echo. You do not have echoes in ordinary sized rooms. With larger distances and hard surfaces, the sounds bounce back at you as echoes, but you do not get echoes if the sound waves are absorbed by surfaces. Soft surfaces do this, why foam is used for sound canceling. The tunnel surfaces do not seem to be soft, but there may be an idea of the McGrew changing the rock into being absorbing of sound waves. It could maybe be caused by the organic layer that grew leaf behind, and maybe to some extent the organic growth on that layer, though I find that very dubious. What I will say is that it's actually possible to do this by just changing the inner shape of the surfaces. A few years ago, scientists invented an acoustic metamaterial that absorbs most sound passing through it without obstructing the airflow in any way is a tube with helical patterns around the inner ring, which would be easy enough for them to grow because it's made with 3D printing. But that specific concept cannot be intentional because that was only a recent invention. And the waveguide says acoustic spider webs makes more ecological sense for them because otherwise we need an explanation for why they want total silence. The tunnels of the dark grotto are also described as smooth. Maybe this is looking at it somewhat the wrong way. The motivation for it could be more purely allegorical. If I'm right that the McGrew are adapted from the absorbers from Rollmaster, perhaps they are absorbing the sounds that run into them. They are certainly soft, described as jelly. They just want to absorb everything. But then, in contrast, there is another spot in the dark grotto, which is essentially an amphitheater, and sounds are amplified in that room. It is described as having no signs of tool use or stone fitting, but it cannot possibly be a natural formation. Assuming the cave itself is on the scale of tens of meters, its Helmholtz resonance frequency would be on the lower end of the human auditory range, somewhere around 50 to 100 hertz, since it's a roughly spherical chamber with a 1 to 2 meter sound hole, which we know because short races do not kneel in the tunnels. In other words, it would resonate bass-pitched sounds, which would probably sort Morgu for holding court. Morgu's all about that bass. No travel. I'm not seriously suggesting the math was done. I think the dome of that room for sound amplification was the qualitative point, but it's interesting to consider because of what the Nietzsche's would do, which I'll get back to in a moment. So the McGrew have clustered sound together into an echo chamber, much as they seem to have done with bones and stone spheres. The shapes in that room were apparently made that way for amplifying and modifying the acoustics. And this cave is the entryway that leads it to the huge cavern and dark shrine. It's difficult to think that is a meaningless coincidence. This might even give a naturalistic explanation for why the McGrew did not go into the huge cavern to eat the lizards, at least the young ones, because the echo chamber may effectively make them deaf in that direction, and they might not want to wander outside to the jacket plane for acoustic reasons. Um, though the small lizards living inside moss bushes may somehow be protecting them. Mosses are plants, not fungus. The fungus light has to be feeding them. Mold is fungus, mushroom is fungus, lichen is partly fungus. I'm not sure if the moss deviation was intentional. 
It also hints they spend time under the water. Amphibians start out in water with gills. Mickleian are described as like amphibians. But if you really wanted to push the metaphor, you could interpret this amphitheater as the horn of a musical instrument. When combined with the tunnels of the Dark Grotto as its tubes, like a huge French horn, or even pipes, eldritch pipes, which is an intriguing possibility. The infernal flutes of Nyarlathotep and Azatov at the Uluant Court of Madness and the nethermost grottos of ultimate chaos, which might well be the explanation for why their description has the Magru pulsing in a hypnotic rhythm. I bet you never thought of the Magru as a flopping horde of mindless and amorphous dancers. Those things are like flubber that burn your face off. I should also point out that the tunnel at the top of the huge stairs next to the dark shrine is described as having been bored. This could be a subtle play on words. The bore of a wind instrument is the interior chamber directing its flow path. So that is something worth considering since the tunnel is where Morgul would enter. Amphitheaters in the Roman context, by the way, were distinct from Roman theaters in that they were used for blood sport. The Colosseum, for example, is an amphitheater. They are round with an oval or circle in the center. That would be the oblong cavern itself, explaining its shape, though likely vertical. Notably, the room painting here attributes the sound amplification to the high-domed ceiling, which is historically how churches were built to amplify sound. Meanwhile, there are deep niches along the walls, but it isn't naively about amplification. The niches would be analogous to the amphorae, acoustic vases, which were used in ancient theaters and set into niches in medieval chapels. That is, this was done in Cistercian monasteries as well. The medieval ones were ceramic, ancient ones were bronze. The practice of embedding them into the walls of churches was in the medieval period. So the esoteric parallel I've been talking about would apply. Musical instruments are banned in Carthusian monasteries, which is an interesting parallel to consider. So these wall niches may implicitly have vases in them, which in context would be the ceramic urns of dark foul fluid that we find in the Dark Shrine. This would be how the dark fluid is harvested from the Magru. They get drawn to the resonating sound, looking to feed, maybe using living sacrifices. The urns become eldritch honeycombs. This may also be a play on words to the extent that Roman amphorae were mostly for storing food, which is likely the purpose of the urns, feeding the gagor with the dark fluid, at least after it has been made nutritious with ritual sacrifices. That'd be extremely subtle, but within the context of the other things we've examined, it's likely the intent. The urns would just have to be made of a material that the acid does not eat, where we've already seen that premise with the dark grotto fungus. The semicircle of terraces and stone platform are certainly more like theaters, so that may be another architectural play on words like the atrium. I think it's because Kygar was trying to emphasize the artificial sound manipulation by comparing it to a stage theater, but at the same time having other reasons for wanting to use the word amphitheater instead. Though amphorae most likely absorb the resonance of unwanted frequencies, they'd sound different to the McGrew than the cavern itself. While I think the acoustic jars interpretation is correct, the niches in the amphitheater grotto might also be air valves. The idea would be that there are air columns, essentially pipes, in the walls reaching down to a lower grotto. The pond in the huge cavern has to drain down like the lake does outside the monastery. So if you have falling water in a deeper grotto under the amphitheater, it would aspirate the air through the Bernoulli principle. So the niches as air valves would act as a pipe organ. This is an ancient type of pipe organ called a water organ, which is sometimes made with waterfalls in lower grottos. There's one of Pope Clement VIII, 16th century, in an ornate recess in the Corinal Palace of Rome. Pipe organs obviously you associate with churches, but not until the medieval period. Instrumental music was not allowed in Catholic churches at first. There's also the Great Stalac Pipe Organ in the Luray Caverns of Virginia. It is by far the largest musical instrument in the world, playing its notes using various sizes of stalactites, though that's percussion, not a water organ, but it could be the inspiration if that was the intent. Knowledge of water organ construction passed down through the writings of Vitruvius, 
as did the acoustic jars. Circle that and put a question mark over it. In the Lovecraft frame, the amphitheater would be based on his novella, The Mound, where the subterranean kingdom living near the waking world vaults of Zen have underground amphitheaters where they watch cruel blood sports involving slaves. And this would be our direct tie-in for the waking world version of the vaults of Zen, with its devolved reptilian quadrupeds and shoggoths, which are the very things from Lovecraft that more directly look like the Nicolian and Gru. Actually, they're not even reptilian anymore. They're quasi-mammalian, some once reptilian race that was crossed with mammal slaves. This is the only Lovecraft story with amphitheaters. The amphitheaters are mentioned about eight paragraphs after the end of the segment about Nkai and the Vaults of Zen. In the in-world frame of reference, there's a wide crack there, and the only reason for a stage platform would seem to be if Morgul came down here to see the Luxor Trogloth to get their dark fluid assuming he needs that for the urns. Then it all dates to the same time period, as expected with the ancient Eurarch. The toad brazers in the Dark Shrine similarly could imply it is contemporary with the Kiska rocks, so there are good reasons independent of the poem puzzle for thinking these were contemporary. But the sound amplification of that room could also be for some sinister ceremony between Morgu and Magru. I would also draw some attention back to that fungi from your goth sonnet number 20, the one about the night gaunts, the peaks of Thok, and the Shoggoths. The Shoggoths splash in the foul lake in doubtful sleep. And it then goes on to say, but oh, if only they would make some sound, or wear a face where faces should be found. This sonnet can also explain the huge cavern being a gray world and add to why the Gagora statues in the dark shrine have pointed tails. So, in light of the sound engineering of the Dark Grotto, we have to take the folk guy from the Agoth seriously, as possibly an intentional parallel, which is significantly reinforcing the Dream Quest underworld theory. They may be gibbering dancers, but they're still shoggoths. The fungus light in the Dark Grotto actually dances. I said earlier that I wanted to look at how the rock surfaces are described in the various areas. It talks about the dark grotto tunnels being smooth as if polished with a brace of cloths, but there are no jagged edges and no scratches or marks in the stone at all. There is no debris and no pebbles or rocks anywhere in the tunnels. The implication, of course, is that the McGrew formed it, which is why the tunnels are irregularly shaped. They keep passing through, sweeping it up. Notably, the walls of the bone pit are not this way at all. They are rough and cracked with sharp intrusions which clearly implies the observable fact that the McGrew did not go into the bone pit. The McGrew, unfortunately, do not do anything to dead bodies mechanically. It would have been cooler if they ate bodies and then duplicated. Up in the dark shrine is somewhat interesting. The tunnel to it is described as bored, as I mentioned a bit earlier. The corridor on the inside is described as carved, and the surface is described as abrasive. I'm not sure if Kygar meant abrasive to imply rough or not polished, Abrasiveness is really about the hardness difference between materials. The corridor is featureless gray stone, undecorated. I'm not sure the McGrew carved out this part. There is no fungus, for example, no molds or anything else like that growing, so that could be a subtle point for being a much older place. Or maybe it was just too long ago, no more food. I said at an earlier point that the McGrew smell is all over the place in the broken land, but that may be overstating it. There are just bad smells all over it. They also vary in strength as you move around. What are the distinct smells? One is a sour, almost metallic smell in Uthex's workshop, and there is a malodorous fog off the sea of mud. The malodorous fog would probably be hydrogen sulfide and smells like rotten eggs, which is an acrid, bitter smell. There is no mention of smells in the rest of Uthex's abode. So it might be from a foreign substance brought into the workshop. His work table is stained and burned by something. Perhaps the corrosive McGrew dark fluid. McGrew tunnels have a sour smell, usually subdued, but it produces a bitter, foul taste at the back of the mouth. When it's more concentrated, the smell stings the eyes and makes it difficult to breathe. Which, by the way, is how the smell of the underworld is described in the Dream Quest. This happens where there's pulverized stone soil and mushrooms growing on it. It only irritates the eyes and those when it's not concentrated. 
So the smell is more likely vapors from the McGrew's caustic dark fluid because you do not get this with the malodorous fog at its source. But it might also be the smell of infectious workshop. Then in the dark shrine, you have something else, a sickeningly sweet smell that is pungent. But the smell also has a subtle, bitter, acidic quality to it. This makes your bile rise and it's hard to breathe. The fetid sweet odors in, are in the rooms with the tall stone jars and urns with foul black fluid. So this appears to be derived from the McGrew dark fluid process somehow. Because there's nothing about it being sweet in the dark grotto. But even if these smells ultimately originate in McGrew or even further back in the chain of causation to the mud sea itself, there seem to be meaningful variations of it across multiple locations. There's also a musty smell in the burial vault, but that is for a completely different reason. And you can smell things like lingering traces of old books and so on. There's something else I had not mentioned in the second episode, which Lily pointed out to me. I've talked about the fog beetles in Nicolene having hard plates. Specifically, this body armor they have is called chitin. I believe that's pronounced chitin, not chitin. But something very subtle about this, chitin is not just found in arthropod exoskeletons. Chitin is also what makes up the cell walls of fungus. It's one of the major defining features of fungus. It's a fibrous polymer and it's in both. It's not a protein like collagen. It's made of amino sugars rather than amino acids. But it might be close enough to bone to explain why they do not eat bones. It might not even be that they do not want to eat it. Chitin is insoluble to sulfuric acid, or at least dilute sulfuric acid when it's at room temperature. That could have something to do with the McGrew not eating it, or why the fungus grows on the residue. By the way, the fungal light in the huge cavern is gray with only hints of individual colors, but the fungus in the dark grotto glows green. We see from the fairy ring of mushrooms later put in the seal of our strake that there's some informed aspects to the fungus. Therefore, it is reasonable to surmise that this chitin relationship may well have been intentional. It's worth mentioning that fungal bioluminescence is caused by the reaction of a chemical called luciferin, from the same etymological root as Lucifer, the light bringer, originally from Roman mythology, which Christian translators of Hebrew adopted from Latin as a name for the devil. For our allegorical purposes, if chitin was intentional, luciferin might be given this other medieval Catholic and possibly Dante stuff. We have the fungus there for Lovecraft reasons anyway, but you never know. It's also worth noting that the ecological reason fungus glows is to attract beetles and insects to spread spores, which could have something to do with the giant fog beetles, maybe when they are still small. So the beetles might start out small implicitly in the dark grotto with the small Miklian. And then from environmental factors, they both become megafauna, both forming these shells of chitin plating. Well, actually, only the tails of the Miklian are explicitly chitinous plate. The rest of their bodies are sharp scales, which may be overplating. So it's unclear if the Miklian vary wholly by color or just their tails. It sounds like only their tails are luminescent. Their vitals would camouflage better with the gray background if their body scales were dull. But I think there's more to this than just sharing a source of fungus. So let's take the weird ecology of the Broken Land seriously. What's going on here, I think, is what is called mimicry. The giant fog beetles have lobster-like tails that fan out, and the Miklian have similarly shaped, stubby, chitinous, triangular tails. It might well be that the fog beetle tails would be luminescent in the dark, but the jagged plane is too bright to see it. There are certainly bioluminescent beetles in the real world. Glowworms only glow in the visible spectrum. The fog beetles of Miklene have, in this interpretation, co-evolved to imitate each other. Recall I had no role master explanation for the Miklene. This is something that exists in the real world, in a specific case in South Africa with lizards and beetles. The bushveld lizards have co-evolved to resemble and stomp around like the local Ugpister beetles. These are like bombardier beetles, which defend themselves with jet sprays of formic acid. They are generally carnivorous or insectivorous. Most beetles are herbivores, not these ones. Various rooms in the Broken Land imply there are other small insects for them to eat. Deteriorated wood, cobwebs, worms, 
One room even mentions parasites. There's also dry rot in the dark shrine, implying dampness and fungus spores up there. The fog beetles may hunt by blending their poison spray into the fog. Giant fog beetles probably kill and eat the hooded figures, but eat these other insects when they are small. There are fungivore insects and animals in general, including whole families of beetles. Obligate fungivores are rare invertebrates because of fungus toxins, so the fungus is at least the base of their food chain. It can partly explain the absence of vertebrates. The hooded figures may need to eat as well, so their mage and sorcerer spells may have been putting a selection pressure on creature magical immunities for millennia, contrary to the assumption that the creatures were first engineered that way. Though it's also possible the whole ecology was designed as a terraforming experiment. Maybe implicitly the figures hunt Miklian and the vortices feed on them. The hooded figures don't mechanically wander off the jagged plain. The Shruvian Monastery has cooks in its own kitchen, but the Shruvian Monastery doesn't count. That was later, and a different GM. They're cannibals, anyway. But bombardier beetles mix chemicals which boil and then expel it as a jet spray, which is exactly the concept that we see with the giant fog beetles. Rollmaster has giant poisonous beetles with large pincers, but not this jet spray. That comes from real life. It's made by chemicals for hardening their shell, or with the oogpisters from eating red ants. Fog beetles might be a hybrid of both ideas, ultimately derived from the fungus. If their poison cloud of gas was always green, that might suggest origins in the glowing green fungus. Instead of jets of acid like the McGrew, the giant fog beetles have jets of poison, which vaporizes so that it's breathed instead of being used for blinding. This would be another point of mimicry aimed at the Miklian, whose plating would only help against the acid spray. There are various real-world poisonous beetles, like rove beetles and blister beetles. Pedohui, which are birds with poisonous feathers from New Guinea, for example, get their toxins from the beetles they eat, which may be how some poison dart frogs work, from eating beetles of the same genus. And the Miklian are described as resembling amphibians. Miklian are not obviously poisonous, but their bright colors might imply it, which is an ecological property called aposematism. Maybe they are poisonous if you eat them, bioaccumulated toxins. Miklian scales are not as lucrative as they used to be, but maybe there could be a black market for Miklian fugu, especially prepared in dangerous delicacy. Gemstone pufferfish, get marketing on it. The real master giant beetles, called jade backs, which blend in with jade rocks, are poisonous, and they are in the exact same block of text as the giant scorpions, which may be why fog beetles are described as resembling the shape in scorpions, but not necessarily. There are scorpion imitators in the real world. For example, the devil's coach horse beetle, which imitates the black scorpion tail. So if that's the inspiration, it might be part of our devil allegory. The fog beetles are dull red, and most Miklians skew toward red, so the beetles would be somewhat camouflaged, their dull red blending into the rocks. The broken landlight likely skews red. Their multi-jointed legs resemble the bony spikes and knobs at the joints of the Miklian, and the Miklian scales are likely supposed to imitate the fog beetle shells. It could go both ways. The beetle tails grow to resemble Miklian tails. The beetles actually spray from their anus, not their tails, which means the tails do not function as stings. The messaging politely calls this an orifice on the creature's underside. That might help with the underbelly of Miklian being soft, because that side would be avoided. Well, that's likely also about taking up belly heat from rock surfaces. They guard their bellies. One of the way paleontologists tell if a dinosaur was warm-blooded is by its stature. Squat quadrupeds with their bellies low to the ground would have been cold-blooded, which could be an interesting point, because the Miklians sometimes travel upright on two legs. So the beetle spray would indirectly help them, provoking avoidance of belly attacks. The perfect Miklian belly skull drops are not original. That's the alchemy system, much later. But the McGrew, probably not coincidentally, are also red. That's the obvious candidate for Predator. The bone pit shows they eat flesh. The absorbers are bluish-purple. If those are the base for the McGrew, they may have adapted to become red. 
so that they would blend in more when going after these prey which skew toward red, which are acid resistant enough for their chitin plates to not get wiped out. None of them are specifically coded for immunity or resistance to acid. May just didn't have an acid bolt spell back in 1994, so that's just a mechanical plot hole. Burning McGrew with acid is just absurd. The luminescence of the Miklian tails and their immunity to cold would protect them from the dark vortices, which dissipate to death when they wander from the edge of the cavern because it gets too bright. McGrew might not see with light, or maybe are colorblind, so it wouldn't matter. Or alternatively, if they do sense colors, the tail might camouflage with a fungus. But as I will explain shortly, I think it's really for the exact opposite reason that the bright colored tails are for luring predators toward the tails. The McGrew do not wander in mechanically, but it may be implicit, since the fungus is likely growing on their residue, then they retreat to their own territory. It would have been interesting to see if the creature behavior messaging between the beetles and Miklian was conspicuously similar. Unfortunately, as I've said, the fog beetle messaging has definitely been altered. I do not know by how much. The creature description for Miklian, as I said, describes them as sometimes getting up on two legs. That might refer to the Jesus Christ lizards that can run across water and then swim under it to avoid predators when they are young. You see hints they are swimming below the cavern stream, which is only deep enough for the small lizards. Devil beetles and Jesus Christ lizards. Interesting. Circle that and put a question mark over it. You also see the small lizards hiding under rocks in the undergrowth. That's typical behavior for real-world small lizards. I would bet they have normal elongated tails. In the second episode, I floated the possibility that the Miklian level and color variation is just their age progression. That could be an inversion of skin lizards, which eat beetles, and can start with bright blue tails, which fade with age, and some skin species end up with red heads as adults. There's a lot of color variation in rainbow skin lizards. The frequency drop would just be following survival. The older they are, the fewer are left. It's possible the luminescent tails on the Miklian are really for luring predators toward a self-amputating appendage. Some lizards do this as a defense mechanism, is how the skinks use their bright colored tails. This might also be why the Miklian tails are stubby, because they are only partly grown back. Which would also explain why only the Miklian tail is described as being chitinous. It would be growing back that way, like tails of cartilage instead of bone. Supposedly, the offensive ability of Miklian would weaken as they took more damage, but not from them going defensive, which is an interesting property, as if they are losing power from having more taken out of them. From what I can tell, it still works this way today. Their AS drops as they become more injured, at least in terms of their blood loss, not necessarily crit damages. Oh, by the way, McGrew will leave gems on decomposing, like the vortices with orbs, which allows you to get their gems without injuring your hand. There are a lot of similar in kind quirks. But damage to the Miklian hide or blood loss dissipating their strength is interesting to consider. Without sunlight, you'd wonder about the Miklian being cold-blooded, but then they are immune to cold and flare coldness. The chill that accompanies the Miklian is probably them magically absorbing the surrounding heat. Scales are made of keratin rather than bone, but the Miklian have bony protrusions. The quirk with Miklian is that their claws unleash cold flares. So the question is if their scales or plate armor cause their thermal properties with cold, which could explain why they get weaker. Claws are also made of hardened keratin, and keratin is very resistant to acid digestion. Keratin is high in sulfur. There are beetles, though, that will decompose keratin. Reptile bony plating, called osteoderms, are involved in thermal regulation. Scales often go over osteoderms, sometimes in one-to-one -one plates. When you search for skin the Miklian, your hand is cut by the sharp edge of one of the plates that form the Miklian's hide, which suggests the scales themselves are plate-like, but it might instead be bony or chitinous plates underneath the scales. So the Miklian may have these plates under their scales, and these are regulating heat energy for them. Damaging it maybe weakens their energy, or maybe less blood, less energy. So there may be a subtle premise here of the Miklian absorbing their power from the background radiation of the huge cavern, which could be variable, and their power varies by their color. Higher energy colors, in terms of light, are more powerful Miklian. 
they are immune to increasingly higher level mage bolts, which might imply absorbing the directed energy. This property seems to no longer exist. But if their color itself is determined by their environment, rather than by, say, age or genetics, then the heat of the cavern itself could be controlling their whole color distribution, similar to how temperature controls the sex ratio of some reptiles, like crocodiles, or other environmental factors, like background color does for flounder. I'll come back to it in a little bit and explain this theory. So, Miglian may be effectively warm-blooded because of the cold magic of their body armor except they're sucking in heat rather than making their own heat internally. That is, actively absorbing heat instead of exporting it, or the more passive thermoregulation of normal reptiles, like how crocodilians do through their osteoderms, or the Michelin themselves do with their bellies, which, if intentional, would be really cool. You might wonder about similar logic for the dark vortices and radiant heat, which absorb power and inflict cold through shafts of darkness, they pull toward their centers and turn into amorphous clouds when not near living prey, which is presumably about minimizing their surface area exposed to light. Notably, they reach out to dead bodies, but nothing happens. There's a recurring motif of absorbing things, especially energy and forms of heat. The vortices are much more mysterious in an ecological sense, with their hazy tenebrous orbs and dissipating in bright light. It seems like they are endless voids, absorbing energy, unless it's visible light which fills them up. Which makes you wonder if all that power or energy is being used for something. The Gagor or Vrul should be purely artificial. But then the Gagor have anti-parallel magical properties which do not come from the source books. They are immune to heat and essence magic, while the vortices are the exact opposite. Immune to cold and non-essence magic. And absorbing magical power, whereas the Vrul arc power is backlash from their leather. The Vrul take damage from magical weapons, the Vortices are immune to weapons. They take crush damage from weapons now, but it sounds like originally they were immune to all weapons. And we should expect this anti-parallel to fit Kaigar's natural growth design philosophy, so there may be some weird or esoteric link between the two things, with the Vrul being black as midnight, and the dark vortices being swirling blackness. Vortices are maybe acting as the power source of the Vrul, which in the source books are blind to bright light, quite possibly a link between them. And the Vrul are apparently fed under tall stone jars with a form of McGrew fluid, likely mixed with the huge cavern moss with its sweet but slightly fetid odor. Notably, the source material says some Gagor did not survive the Millennium Suspension, implying they starved. So there may be an upkeep process where the cultists, or Morgu himself, replaced the tall stone jar fluid. Maybe the water dropping the form stalagmites is meant to imply shelter for the Miklian from Morgu. The idea might have been Morgu goes down there, but sticks to the edges of the huge cavern. And the Vrul and Vortices do not like going into the forest because it's too bright. You might even imagine Miklian immunities passing into Vrul through the moss. So even the Vrul are tied into the ecology of the Dark Grotto, whether or not this is supposed to be how they are created. And perhaps Dark Vortices are even symbiotes of them. Or perhaps they are voids in the background energies formed by the Miklian. The background radiation, both magical and non-magical. So they absorb both mana and heat or light. The unlife or anti-essence is described as a void in the essence background, similar to how antimatter was first conceived of as holes in the sea, where the unlife wants to consume essence and self-annihilate, and the extended dark vortice description says they drain the life out of everything around them, which is at least something worth noting. These are exotic possibilities, but if all of these are supposed to be co-evolved adaptations over a long period of time in those habitats, it becomes curious that their properties would be named in the very ancient language of Irreric, which suggests artificial origins or intelligent design and Lord of Essence technology. It isn't absolutely clear who named those things and when it happened. We just have the premise of fell beasts in Uthex's experiments. Bombardier beetles actually are a commonly used example of we don't believe that could have happened naturally by creationists. But it makes one wonder how many of the creatures are really originating in Uthex's power-given physical form. 
to what extent this is co-evolution and to what extent it was an experiment in artificial ecology. One would think of Uthex as a weapons researcher and not an artificial habitat researcher. They may have originated in the Lords of Essence and he was studying how they work. If he was an evil alchemist, that includes making artificial entities. It might be that this weird ecology is merely what has since survived of Uthex's own experiments. It could be 6,000 years of selection pressure or 100,000 years. It should be the latter if the rules slumbering in the groove fluid, but it could be less if they were made after Kadena. I'm sure there was an actual intent for it, but it's not so easy to firmly exclude the various timeline possibilities. Maybe the Crystal Dome is only relevant for their ultimate origins, except for recycling the hooded figures. And the amount of sunlight is not clear. The sky might be severely shrouded with ash and dust, assuming it is open sky on the surface. Gagor, as I said, are completely blinded by sunlight and take penalties in overcast skies. Their tails, remember, are poisonous barbs as well. It is not clear if there are any scorpions in the Broken Land, but there are definitely cruel with bloody claws. Recall Uthex's bas relief depicts the Orhan of the Broken Land Dimension with huge impact craters, because the Lords of Orhan terraformed the Orhan of Kalthea's Dimension when they arrived. Something cataclysmic may have happened and deeply altered this environment. So the power-absorbing Crystal Dome may be acting as a sun analog. It would be the ultimate energy source driving and sustaining the whole ecological system, though that depends on the exact relationship between it and the geothermal activity. So I believe, regardless, these are survival adaptations for the creatures, and it probably has common roots in the glowing fungus, whose spores the insects would spread around, like Darwin had for the co-evolution of insects and flowering plants. It might be that implicit small insects carry fungal spores, and the small lizards are eating the insects. Then the beetles have adapted to resemble these predators as they get bigger with them. The dark grotto tunnels are limited to gravity squished McGrew dimensions, which is an upper bound on width. Then when the beetles get too big, they move to the plane and start eating the hooded figures. There's messaging showing they are regarding your body as a meal when they kill you. Either way, the lizards are likely consuming fungus, which glows in the dark. And we have an implied diversity of fungus between the grotto and cavern. So you have the huge Miklian cavern, the Kiska rocks, along with their luminescent chitinous plates. And as I argued before, the cave lizards live in bushes of moss, and they probably grow up into myclean by eating the glowing fungus in the huge cavern. So their hard plates come from the fungus. You are what you eat. And if it is the chitin specifically that the McGrew will not eat, or they can sense the chitin and avoid it, that would explain why they have wiped out everything except the myclean and fog beetles which both have shells over their grotesquely enlarged bodies made out of chitin. Essentially two independent arguments for staying in the dark grotto. It might also be the beetles got their poison from fungus toxins, and their giant shells may come from fungus in a similar way, though of course insects grow chitin anyway. That's another argument for the magic mushrooms or what make them nightmares. The McGrew are still nightmare immune, actually. They give the creature is a nightmare failure messaging against the Nightmare spell, even though they are not undead. I'm not sure if the Fog Beetles and Miklian at prior times had that property. It would not have been initially. Sorcerer spells were only implemented through level 10 in February 1994, and Nightmare was originally 713. The Purple Miklian is one of the standard Sorcerer Nightmares, so in a way, that would actually be quite literal. Dreamland tint, maybe? Who knows? So, the Miklian plates likely glow because the fungus they eat glows. Though that cavern is washed out gray, there's almost no color. So, it would not explain the Miklian color spectrum, unless the gray light is a composite effect. As I mentioned before, it is not just that the Miklian come in different colors, it's that it is the color spectrum. The Newtonian colors, like would be produced by a prism, light through crystals like the crystals in that cavern with all of its pale fungus light. Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Except indigo and violet are merged as purple. But combining colors will turn them toward white light, or gray with hints of color around the edges. 
temperature or color light sources in different positions, and various fungi glows in different colors. Maybe there's nothing more to it than the theme of light and crystal spires as huge prisms. Prisms can disperse white light into colors. They can also be used to recombine colors. But there might be more to it. That isn't the only detail. It is not just that these colors are present. It's that the power of the Miklian is in the order of the color spectrum. Red through purple is the order of weakest to strongest. This is consciously matching the color sequence. Now, the dome pulses with dim multicolored lights, which may be for a fiction parallel reason. But it's not all obvious why the Miklian should be a color spectrum, unless maybe it is from eating different colors of fungus. But that would not really explain the power scaling, nor why these should cause magical immunities. So what might really be going on here? Well, I do not know what kind of background Kygar had in real life, how much he knew of the physical sciences. I would say we cannot dismiss the possibility these areas were informed by geology. But what about other physics, like thermal radiation and light? After all, the Miklian are thermal, overtly associated with cold. So I'm going to suggest something really radical, totally radical, call it a moonshot. I'm not really arguing this is how it is, it's more of a this is how I would have done it. But I noticed something interesting when looking at statistics for the Miklian. That is Ice Age data from 1994 when they were Kiska rocks. Even if it was right then, it might be different now. When Trachtin or whomever compiled frequency data estimating their spawn rates, it was a set of numbers that decreased from red through purple in the order of the color spectrum. Low levels are more frequent. But the only exception is young Miklian, which have no color. They were less frequent than red, orange, and yellow. They are also the weakest Miklian. So you look at this chart, and the numbers are a little fudged because they actually add up to 103%. But it says 51% red, 25% orange, 13% yellow, 8% young, 3% green, 2% blue, and 1% purple. And I would note that the colorless ones are in the middle of the other colors, which could be an overlap premise. But anyway, if you have a mathematical background, this instantly leaps off the page at you. That looks very much like it is a geometric series. That is the geometric series of 1 over 2, the number 1 half multiplied with itself. That would be 50%, 25%, 12.5%, 6.25%, 3.125%, 1.5625%, and 0.71825%. These are one half, one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second, and so on. Except we will be limited by integers and we have no decimals, so round them 50%, 25%, 13%, 6%, 3%, 2%, Looks pretty damn close, right? Here's the thing when you add up the geometric series of 1 over 2, a finite number of times, in this case it is seven times, is inevitably going to fall a little short of one. Why is that the case? Because the infinite summation of the geometric series of one half is exactly equal to one. It does not blow up to infinity, it converges on the number one. This is pretty easy to prove actually. Let s equal the infinite summation of the series. S equals one half plus one quarter plus one eighth plus one sixteenth plus and so on. Now multiply both sides of the equation by 2. 2s two equals 1 plus 1 half plus 1 quarter plus 1 eighth plus 1 sixteenth plus, and so on. Compare these two equations and you'll notice something familiar. The original infinite series s is contained in the new one. 2s equals 1 plus s. So if you subtract s from both sides, s equals 1. But that means the infinite sum equals 1. Select trick, right? Look, I never said there would be no math, okay? But what's cool about this for our purposes is that fractions can be interpreted as percentages. And if the percentages add up to exactly 100%, they can be interpreted as probabilities. Meaning, if you wanted to make these into spawn rates, they'd fit right onto a D100. Except you have no decimal points, so you have to slightly fudge it. And you only have a finite number of fractions in it. So you have to slightly fudge it for that, too. I do not know how spawns work or worked mechanically under the hood. If it decides to spawn everything separately, say, and the available creatures have their own propensity weightings, 
or if it's, say, a D100 roll, where the roll lands in the number range selects a creature. Maybe 0 to 49 spawns red and and 1574 spawns orange, and so on. To fit the color spectrum, you'd have to merge indigo and violet, because after you get past blue, you're under 1% each. It's either that or get rid of the young Mickleian. Weird coincidence, right? But what does it all mean, Basil? Maybe that's just a math trick. Maybe it's not really there. Maybe the data takers didn't have enough data and just read a pattern to what they had. But let's assume for the sake of argument the data is or was valid. And let's assume there's more to it than a math trick. Why do this with the color spectrum? Well, if you have a background in the physical sciences with respect to the behavior of light, you would know that the statistical distribution of light is not uniform. When you have an object at a given temperature, it emits light with a whole spread of colors. But the amount of each color varies, and it varies by a very distinct pattern. This is called the black body distribution of thermal radiation. I'll explain why it is called that a bit later. It's Planck's law. It's where the H and H bar comes from, the famous constant for quantum mechanics also known as Planck's constant. But the point is that if you have some color as being the light present in the highest amount at a given temperature, then the other colors that are higher and lower than it in energy will be less frequent. And they will be less frequent by the shape of the statistical distribution. So if your most frequent light at a temperature happens to be visible red light, then the rest of the visible spectrum will drop off in frequency, becoming less and less frequent as you go toward violet. Those colors after red are more energetic, being light waves with shorter wavelengths. The Michelin become more powerful in the same order as the color energy, which by itself is interesting and quite likely intentional. And that difference in the light waves' wavelengths is the reason prisms disperse colors. So this distribution is a continuous function. The drop-off is decaying as an inverse exponential. But what am I getting at here? What else might be happening? If you know the calculus for the infinite summation of the geometric series, then you also know that you can re-express continuous functions, like the exponential function, as infinite summations. When you look at the infinite sum equivalent with the exponential function, what do you find? It is very closely related mathematically to the geometric series. Exponential decay with only a finite number of points, discrete instead of continuous, essentially. So the frequency distribution of Michelin can be easily read as the black body distribution of their color spectrum, at least at a given temperature. But a given temperature of what? This is where we run into a wall, because the crystal dome actually gets hotter and brighter as you pump more power into it, which is what happens with light when you pump more heat energy into something. But the crystal dome has mechanics, some unknown number of mechanics, which have been removed and no longer exist. There's no longer a puzzle for turning it off. There's no longer a distance-based rate of power drain. What would I have done if I had been designed the Kiska racks? I would have coded it so that as you send more power into the crystal dome, there would be thresholds. And then at these hotness thresholds, it would rotate the relative frequencies of the Kiska racks. Now that is one notch hotter, red is 25%, orange is 50%, yellow is 13%, and so on. And the next notch is Red is 6%, orange is 25%, yellow is 50%, green is 13%, blue is 3%, purple is 2%, then maybe red is 2%, orange is 6%, yellow is 25%, green is 50%, blue is 13%, purple is 3%, or whichever exact cycle for reshuffling the frequency order. So you would be approximating the black body distribution of light with increasing temperature discreetly with a D100. Then as the crystal dome slowly cools off, it would automatically shift back to normal. Or if the dome explodes, it immediately resets as the dome is out of power. Can you imagine? That would be so effing cool. It should totally work that way. Then you would have an explanation for the colors and a clear mechanistic link with the crystal dome. Strictly speaking, the overall spawn frequency should increase with the dome hotness because the light intensity of all colors increases with temperature. It's not dark in the core of a star, after all, even though it's mostly gamma rays. It's still a hell of a lot brighter and visible light than a light bulb. So why is it called a black body distribution anyway? Real objects have some irregularities because of the materials they're made from. Line spectra stuff, it's ultimately for quantum mechanical reasons. You can tell what stuff is made from through spectroscopy because molecules absorb and emit specific light waves. 
they create jaggedness in the mountain shape of the light frequency distribution. Imagine if that metaphor were intentional. That's pushing it too far. Idealized thermal radiators are called black bodies. They are ideal emitters and absorbers of all frequencies of light. What is the actual model of an ideal black body? What is the thought experiment for it? It is a dark insulated chamber where there is only a tiny little hole for allowing light to enter it. So the light that enters it is almost certainly not going to escape back out. It is absorbed and emitted, absorbed and emitted. You end up with an equilibrium temperature. The light inside the chamber from the thermal radiation will have this block body statistical distribution. There's nothing mystical about it. You can derive the equation using statistical physics for light. The stuff at room temperature radiates mostly in infrared, which our eyes cannot see. Things that are red hot are hot enough to be glowing visibly red. Hotter temperatures shift toward higher energy light. So what am I getting at? Look at the dark grotto, the huge cavern in the McGrew tunnels. There is a narrow crack out to a dim lit plane where the only obvious light source is the crystal dome. Though I think there's at least some kind of suffused light source because of what you can see from the window of the dark shrine. Then you have a narrow tunnel leading toward the amphitheater, which is essentially an echo chamber where there's a wide crack essentially perpendicular to the dark grotto entry tunnel, which is otherwise a straight line which then leads into the huge cavern, which is dark and totally enclosed. This is pretty much exactly the definition of the ideal black body, except for the glowing fungus, which we have there for fiction allegory reasons, with the pale light and gray washed out colors and the mountain of gray stone. Non-ideal black bodies are known as gray bodies, so we're still good. Light comes in, bounces around, very hard to get back out, Imagine if that was actually intentional. The Kiska rocks are the visible light spectrum. The Diara Cool are outside the visible spectrum. So maybe our redesign of the Crystal Dome goes one step further. It maybe modifies the spawn rate of the dark vortices. Or maybe as the Crystal Dome gets hotter, the level of illumination in the dark cavern increases. It starts pushing back how far the dark vortices can wander safely because when the room is too bright, they begin dissipating and are mostly unable to attack anyone. Or maybe as it gets hotter, the uh, element that the Mickleen flare shifts from cold up to increasingly hotter elements. That would have been completely awesome. It is absolutely, totally should have worked that way. There is no evidence at all that it ever did work that way. Only an interesting spawn rate frequency distribution. But if you want to make this your head cannon, your own personal fandom, then I will not blame you at all, because I am appealing to the principle of awesomeness on this matter, the highest possible authority. The last thing I would like to look at more closely is the puzzle for opening and closing the huge door of the monastery. The puzzle itself is simple in terms of figuring out how to solve it. Familiars are able to get inside the monastery when the door is closed, because it only shuts up to the edge of the door jamb. This leaves a small gap at the side that familiars can still squeeze through. They are not tall enough to pull the stone lever to open the door. So they can go down into the sewer through the privy. You guess which ring is to pull to open the floodgates. Then you get rocks, carry them to the other end, and put them in the basket. The floodgates are metal doors that slide up into the ceiling. There are rings of the same metals attached to pulleys. The doors on the ends are pure metals, iron and copper. The two between them are their alloys, steel and bronze. Their sequence is probably not coincidental. The alloys are adjacent to their base metals. So it's easy to remember which doors to go through when you're in the middle. There are three rings in each room in some order, steel, copper, and bronze. The middle ring opens both doors if they are both closed. The others open and close the matching metal door, except for the bronze ring in the first room. That opens the iron door to get back outside. The iron rings are on the two far sides for opening the pure metal doors from the outside. What is more interesting to think about is how the mechanism for the monastery door actually works. When you look at the basket room, it explicitly calls that a counterweight. The basket is hanging from chains and pulleys connected to gears. When you put a rock in the basket, it shifts down a bit, and then the gears turn with the added weight. The word counterweight is correctly used in its engineering sense of being the balance for an effort load. The room painting says the counterweight for a rather large heavy mechanism. 
so a mechanism in engineering makes use of mechanical advantage, such as a heavy weight balancing a leverage weight. The way this works is that your distances from a fulcrum pivot, say, are not equal to each other. The counterweight is close to the pivot, the effort weight is away from the pivot. Torque is essentially rotational force and it increases with distance. You're able to lift much heavier stuff with leverage. We have a counterweight deep on the ground that is some distance away from the heavy stone door. There's a system of gears between them for translating these forces. The gears are basically rotational levers. Small gears mesh with the teeth of larger gears, which have larger radii, which creates a mechanical advantage in rotating. But here's the rub. The mechanism is not as simple as add enough weight to the basket and then torques open the door. Let's get real. We have a counterweight that is nowhere near as heavy as the weight being moved. That's backwards for a simple lever or crane. Counterweights would be the heavier thing closer to the fulcrum. So the force for moving the door is not coming from the counterweight by itself. It's a factor that makes a difference on top of this heavy mechanism. In fact, it's overtly an additional factor for if they wanted to hold the door. Because the heavy mechanism itself has its own weight, and this is not the only way to open the door. There's a stone lever next to the door. It will also open the door if you pull it. It will do this even if the counterweight basket is empty, and it does nothing if the basket is too heavy. When you open the door with the basket, the door is seemingly held open indefinitely. It only closes again because the rat snakes come and empty the basket. But when you open the door by pulling the stone lever, eventually the door shuts again on its own. There's a time delay, five minutes. It's not like there's a digital clock counting down in the monastery, even though that's how the script is actually simulating it. There has to be some within-world mechanism that takes five minutes to trigger to make the door swing shut again. It takes four rocks in the basket to have enough weight to make the door stay open regardless. It does not seem to vary at all with the rock shapes or the size of the familiar. With anything less than four rocks, it behaves as if there are zero rocks, which is the closest we can get to studying the intermediate case. When you pull the stone lever and the door swings open, you hear a loud ratcheting sound of gears turning. Ratchets are a specific kind of gear that only allow rotation in one direction. There is a pawl which glides over the curved teeth of the ratchet, which then falls down into the spaces between them. When the ratchet is spinning the right way, the pawl does not provide any impedance to it. You would hear a clacking and ratcheting sound when it's spinning in this direction. But if you try to turn the gear the opposite way, the pawl jams into the teeth. So if the door is already open because of the ratchet, you have to lift the pawl which makes the door swing shut quietly. If all the stones are taken, the door closes immediately, which requires the pawl to not be set down, or else the ratchet was disconnected, but we'll assume it's connected. So the pawl has to lift and lower separately from the door being open or closed, even though their timing is related under normal circumstances. Unfortunately, familiars cannot remove stones from the basket, so we cannot test how fast the door closes if you take one away. We can only see the input and output behavior for partial counterweight when the familiar has not yet added four rocks. It might not have always been this way. There used to be actual rat snakes wandering around stealing rocks. So this puzzle may have been tampered with, replacing them with an all or nothing basket emptying. Or it might be the actual creatures only took rocks for partially filled baskets. Or it might be that they were just decoration and it was always just a timer. And we are blocked from taking partly away from a full basket. So the complications of that case cannot happen. But for the sake of completion, I will include logic for the whole intermediate case. Because the door would not necessarily close automatically. It works as normal with less than four rocks. So if you pull the lever when the door is already opened by the rocks, you hear the ratcheting, but nothing happens. Whereas if you pull the lever while the door was lever open, that makes the door swing shut silently. While if you open it with the rocks, the door swings open almost silently, without ratcheting, so the pawl is not even down when you have it open with the rocks, or it is held open with gears that include no ratchet. Now, this is interesting, right? It's not as simple as lifting the pawl unleashes a spring-like restoring force that automatically closes the huge stone door. There's something that has to drive the gears to instead rotate in the opposite direction. It is not the counterweight. The basket is actually empty in this situation. What the huge door needs is a big applied force to pull it backwards. It's not like a crane, where gravity would do it. An object at rest will stay at rest. 
The counterweights really are there as balances on a mechanism to make it easier to do the applied work of leveraging heavy things. With a crane, for example, the counterweight makes lifting the load against gravity take less applied force from pulleys, and it determines how much weight the crane can hold without tipping over. But gravity is a vertical force. It's only causing friction for this door. Elevator counterweights actually weigh less than loaded elevators because elevators also have a motor. The point of the elevator counterweight is to reduce the load on the motor. Here, the counterweight weighs much, much less than the huge door. So we have some implicit power source behind the gear train. In context, this is obviously hydraulic. There's probably a water wheel somewhere under the monastery exploiting the flow of the underground river, just as there's a water wheel involved in lifting the elevator what is now Melbourne's Reach. You might question whether a hydraulic automatic door opener could qualify as medieval. This might be an anachronism, but actually in the other direction. Hero of Alexandria built the first automatic door in the first century AD. They used a fire in front of a temple to turn water below it into steam. The steam would pass from one vessel to another vessel. This was about a century after Vitruvius. The water would condense in this colder vessel, which was a well-balanced counterweight to the temple doors. Then if the fire died out, cooling off the main vessel, linked by a hose and with negative pressure, the water would get sucked back to the main vessel, lifting the counterweight. This was connected to the temple door post underground via pulleys. So the temple doors would open and shut with the fire. That's not what is happening here exactly, but it could easily have been the inspiration. The colonnade portico in front of the monastery door could be hinting at it, as the Temple of Alexandria was a colonnade enclosed with a roof. Everything in the monastery entryway is either too modern or too ancient compared to the medieval setting, like the writing in the broken land. But here the anachronisms are only on an allegorical level. There were also automatic doors in China a few centuries later, making use of water clocks. The temple doors of Alexandria would have been significantly lighter, made of wood. The monastery's door is heavy stone, so the counterweight isn't as simple. There has to be hydraulic power behind the mechanism acting as a motor. So our counterweight ought to be more like an elevator's counterweight. This is an example of a black box, a situation of knowing the inputs and outputs but without knowing what's in the box, trying to infer what is inside it. There are multiple designs which will yield the same input and output characteristics, which for us means the game text showing what actually happens. What actually exists out there in the world, the device, is an implementation of an idealization. The internal design for producing the behavior is the device's authorial intent. For our purposes, amusingly, that is completely literal. We have no way of knowing if it even had one. The point of engineering is to invent the design, not discover it. It's the script for the movie. The movie is the actual device. If you botch the design or the implementation, the device won't do what you intended. The imperfect implementation may instead match another design you have not intended. Sort of like how the computer executes the bug code you actually wrote, not the heuristic you were intending for it in your pseudocode. And the actual code you wrote is hidden by the compiler. Design is metaphors, engineering is allegory. It's a mad, mad world. So we can imagine ways this black box might work, but no way to improve their actuality, only their consistency. Let's do a thought experiment trying to design the internal mechanism of the monastery door to a first approximation. We'll file the patent for it later. The monks are in no condition to challenge it. For simplicity, we will start by assuming there's only one water wheel. Let's say the door is closed and you pull the stone lever. This makes a valve turn, opening a faucet, allowing water to fall on one side of the water wheel, which transmits torque through the wheel's axle in one direction into the gear train. This happens to be the direction that makes the door open, or it gets stuck open with a ratchet. The gears themselves can work almost silently, but the ratchet part makes loud noises. The wheels most likely stop spinning when the door has opened or closed all the way as the falling water is still applying force, but those two forces cancel out. That whole actions having equal but opposite reactions thing, in which case there's virtually no delay from having to reverse pre-existing angular momentum in the wheel. We'll use that as the base assumption, but leave the shaft design matter open. The wheel might still be spinning while powering other things. So, 
the water falls off the wheel into an asymmetrically shaped bucket. Some small fraction of the water or it would fill up too fast. The steady flow rate of the water makes this into a timer because there's a fixed amount of time to fill it. When the bucket fills up too much, it tips over, spilling the water out. It turns out this takes five minutes to happen. This pulls a switch, which lifts the pawl from the ratchet. There's also the yanks on pulleys that reach the valves. The first faucet closes and the second one opens. The same mechanism that would switch the valves if you pulled the stone lever when the door is open. The second faucet is now dripping water on the opposite side of the water wheel. This transmits torque in the opposite direction to the gear train, which immediately causes the huge door to swing shut. We have it turning the bucket up on a delay, which in turn drops the pole again. There is always water falling on one or the other side of the water wheel, so it is always trying to either open or close the door, but closing the door is delayed by the ratchet. So in this scheme, the ratchet is linked to the bucket and the lever and not determined directly by the state of the door. This gives us our constraint of the ratchet still making gear-driven noises when the door was opened without it. The wheel might even only be in gridlock with the door if it's held open by the lever mechanism, and we have it so the lever can switch the valve toward the opening faucet, but pulling the lever again releases the pawl and dumps the bucket. It's the bucket that switches to the closing faucet, and that closes the door before five minutes. What about the counterweight basket? If you fill that with too many rocks, the door swings open and then stays open until the rocks are removed. It swings open almost silently because it is not using the ratchet, which is part of the lever mechanism. You can pull the lever when the door is basket open and hear the ratchet. The pawl will get lifted on its own when the bucket fills up. The lifting the pawl from the ratchet will not close the door without reducing the counterweight basket. It is the door not being heavy enough to resist being rotated by the gears from the force of the counterweight. If you remove all of the rocks, the door swings shut immediately because of the water wheel, which resets the bucket and makes the pawl fall back onto the ratchet. The only hand wave we'd have to make is the ratchet tanks are only emptying the basket when the pawl is lifted from the ratchet, because if we have pulled the lever when the door is open, there should still be a five minute delay. Again, assuming the ratchet is connected in the full basket scenario. The puzzle timers are probably not coded with that level of nuance, or rather, the timer has an artificial coincidence in it. We can resolve this edge case, or perhaps corner case, by having the counterweight hold down the pawl when the basket becomes heavy enough to make the door swing open silently. Then you always get the ratcheting sound when you pull the lever. The only catch with that, so to speak, is that it has to happen only after the huge door is open, or else the door is being rotated by gears, not by the ratchet connected to the lever. Maybe the counterweight switches it to another mechanism entirely from the lever, so it immediately opens and closes with the four rock threshold as a trigger. We might also have the faucet get stuck on the door opening spin direction by the counterweight, then switch to the closing direction when the rocks get taken away, and the wheel turns the bucket back up, resetting it. What about the intermediate case, which we can always indirectly study? If you still have some rocks in there, the intermediate case, we know from filling up the basket, it should be acting normally, which means that removing a single rock should not necessarily automatically allow the door to swing shut unless, as I just said, it's switching between separate mechanisms entirely. But let's assume it's still the same gear train. The water wheel is perhaps able to turn the bucket back up, even though it is failing to close the door, which switches the valves, which makes the wheel spin the other way. So let's walk through it, see if this might work. The wheel is spinning toward open at the speed it acquired when the basket was fully loaded and only powering the wheel. The wheel, in this view, is still spinning and applying forces because it isn't the lever mechanism pushing the door. The counterweight mechanism is now balanced with the weight of the door rather than overpowering it. Lifting the counterweight switches the valves so the wheel switches toward the closing of the door. And lifting the counterweight also lifts the pawl. But what if we find the door stays open? This is purely hypothetical because the game prevents us from seeing what happens in this case. There was not enough torque on the door to overcome its static friction, or what the counterweight adds toward opening it. Because, again, in this case, the basket is partly full, and that weight leverages the door toward open. Eventually, the basket turns up, because that's part of the wheel's closing rotation, and that happens before the door budges, if it would have budged. So, regardless, it is held open even when the wheel spins in the closing direction, which makes the bucket turn up. Since the pawl is switched by the bucket, it then locks the door open with the ratchet. The door would ordinarily have closed first, 
But since it didn't, the pawl now holds the door open. The valve switched, and the wheel spins in the opening direction. And the bucket tips over after five minutes, which causes the valves to switch again, and will also lift the pawl from the ratchet at the same time. This time it's different. The impact of the water suddenly hitting the wheel is a dynamic load, which overpowers the weights and shuts the door. What kind of voodoo did I just pull there? Why was it the wheel overpowering the weight counterweight on the first pass? We had the wheel spinning in the opening direction when the door was held open by the counterweight. This was not the gridlock situation. The lever mechanism was still turning gears toward open. It was the open-ended action, so the water wheel could keep on spinning in that direction. The water wheel was being held under steady flow while the door was stuck open. It was rotating at a magic frequency with the water, or at least a limited speed in the same direction. Then rocks were removed from the basket, but not all of them, only enough to counterbalance with the huge door, and the water wheel spinning toward closed under that flow was not enough to overcome friction. It had to reverse the pre-existing angular momentum, still driving the door toward open. The delay is long enough to let the bucket turn up before the door is moved. Then the bucket switched the valves, which changed the wheel's rotation. The wheel immediately halts as it cannot push the door further, because we're doing it with the lever mechanism. When the valve then switched again, the water hit an unsynchronized stationary wheel smacked with a running start. This is a dynamic load because the wheel is not instantly responding, and it's not losing torque to the deceleration of the wheel. Or if you like, there isn't enough time to disperse the force through the wheel, so the jerk of the impact concentrates on the axle of the water wheel. That brief spike of excess torque may overpower the static friction. Now in motion, the kinetic friction is lower than the static friction, and the wheel, though still speeding up in the closed direction, is nevertheless able to make the huge door swing closed, because the friction force it has to overcome is lower, so the door is now behaving normally. Think of it like a tall building where it is holding up all the weight of the floors above it, but if that were to all fall down by one floor, the whole building will collapse, even though the amount of mass being supported is not changed. It's just not the same situation with the forces. But is this plausible? This is one of those shut up and calculate situations that come down to needing actual numbers. It might not actually be feasible given the rotational inertia of the water wheel. We have not specified whether there is, say, a differential for the wheel. And we're purely assuming this pathological case would even happen, that the normal bucket delay gets ahead of the huge door closing. It might be that the wheel is halted in the open direction. Lifting the counterweight lifts the pawls, which is the valve, so it is immediately in a closing direction. And the door swings almost silently shut immediately, but having a pathological case is more interesting. But what if this does not fly with the numbers and you need to do it differently? Instead of relying on that dynamic load hand wave, then maybe you redesign it so that when there is an intermediate basket weight, the bucket pulleys are yanking the faucets wider so there's more water hitting the wheel. So then the bucket induced phase happens and the wheel ends up spinning faster. When you're past the four rock threshold, you have the faucet speed narrower. This is essentially us doing a hack on the medieval hydraulics, trying to keep the single wheel design working outside of ordinary parameters. But you get the general idea of how this would work. Now, there is absolutely no direct evidence of a wheel or a bucket, all these details of the internal mechanism. Even if it's powered by a water wheel, for example, overshot wheels are not the only way to do it. Suppose the rotational inertia of the overshot wheel makes switching directions too slow, and we decide for this reason we need a design that switches faster, because we need a door that suddenly swings open and closed. You might pass the whole river through a junction between channels with their own undershot wheels. One channel would have a switch filling up a basin, releasing with a weight-triggered floodgate, essentially the same function as the bucket. Then whichever wheel is not acting on the door powers the floodgates. Undershot wheels are inefficient, so use the whole river. Say the wheels were on opposite sides of the door. One will spin clockwise, the other counterclockwise, because that's a 180-degree rotation on the vertical axis. The stream inputs left on one, right on the other which would then torque the gears for turning the door in opposite directions. Though for the water wheels, their tangents would both be upstream. You'd have to invert the signal with gear placement. But you would have wheels held in uniform rotation until the door halted, instead of having to reverse the direction of a single wheel. Maybe the undershot wheels do not give enough power, so you do the same thing with overhanging aqueducts. And these channels drop onto two separate overshot wheels instead, and one of those sides has a bucket. 
where you have both spin at the same time and you switch between which one is driving the gears, which would give almost instant response times for opening and closing the door. So the mechanism could almost certainly be designed in other ways. But what I'm describing is a quasi-medieval machine. What I think is interesting is that there is correct usage of specific language here of counterweights and mechanisms and ratchets. So we can reasonably say that it is informed by some degree of mechanics or even engineering, which makes it plausible the hydraulic mechanism actually has an internal logic that is beyond the superficial logic of the puzzle itself. If it had an actual design in an engineering sense, then it's really more like a puzzle within a puzzle, even though there is no way to uniquely determine the physical components of its implementation. And we can think of the internal logic of everything in the broken land as a big puzzle. Though speaking of puzzles, I misspoke earlier about the Crystal Dome puzzle on the Jagged Plain. I said only piercing gaze and phase work on it, but that is wrong. There are a handful of other spells that work on it, which I did not address in episode one, which actually is important, so we have to go over it. Okay, this will be the last, last thing. Seriously. So I'm pretty sure parts of the dome puzzle have been deleted for whatever reasons. Presumably mechanical reasons, because the scripts would have been ancient. And we have some cryptic tower with an unknown relationship to things. The way it shows up as a bug in the monastery sewer, segment 95, makes me suspect it's not Shruvian. The Shruvian monastery is segment 487. The original broken land is segment 306. That is probably something older, some older script misbehaving. They would have had to update the scripts for Seg 487 because the power drain happens in Segment 487 also. But it might well be that the missing puzzle pieces for the dome were tied to the crystals and boiling mud objects. Like I've mentioned, Ricarth thinks he remembers casting 703 Forget on the crystals. But some spells do still work on the dome itself, and it actually does something useful. It's just more subtle than the messaging that happens for piercing gaze and phase, because it's modifying part of the dome's spell absorb messaging. I could have sworn they all gave the same message, but I did not have logs of testing it, so my eyes must have been glazing over the messaging differences. And I did not do testing with multiple professions in close succession to each other, where the messaging difference becomes much more obvious, so it's a pure accident I did not discover it sooner. What happens is that there are certain protective shield defensive spells, specifically spells suggesting energy shields, which all existed in 1993, and those shield spells are absorbed in a special way in the dome. These spells are 107, 310, 507, and 919. So at a minimum, you need a cleric and a wizard, or else scrolls or whatever, if you only have one character. 107, Protection 2, now Spirit Warding 2, makes the dome shimmer deep blue, which is like the messaging for 107. 310, Protection Sphere 1, now Warding Sphere, makes a hazy white sphere briefly appear around the dome. The spell effect for 310 is a sphere of pure white light. 507, Deflection, now Elemental Deflection, makes the dome suddenly shine in a dazzling array of light. The spell effect for 507 is a shimmering field of energy. 919 Wizard Shield makes a shimmering sphere materialize around the dome briefly, while its spell messaging is a translucent sphere forms around you. Go figure. But three or more of those spells in the dome will update the dim multicolored pulsing ambient. It will be followed by an energy barrier message, which can also ambience separately. When you have three of the spells absorbed into the dome, a faint gray barrier immediately surrounds the dome and then fades without anything interesting happening. The power drain still happens in this state of three shield spells. It's something like 20% of your mana. In the Ice Age, it allegedly drained linearly with distance from the Crystal Dome. Six power points at the dome, dropping off to one power point. It seems full strength now at three shield spells. If you have all four of those spells in the dome, a shimmering multicolored barrier surrounds the dome, shifting and undulating. 
bright flashes emanating from the dome are reflected back at the dome by this magical barrier. The pulse of dim, multicolored light will be followed by this ambient messaging. So while this is under effect, it blocks the dome from draining power. The shield spells seal off the dome from its surroundings, but it's still permeable to solid matter. You can still touch the dome. It is not turning the dome off, much less turning the fog off. It is only blocking the power draining effect in some of the light. Phasing the dome or overcharging it with too many casts will still get you badly hurt or killed, because it's the power rushing out in those cases, not the light. The barrier is only blocking the light and power absorb. It is still there if the dome explodes, which triggers at 2,000 mana. So it might be that phase and overloading it are just traps for people trying to figure out the puzzle, that there are no useful conditions for phasing the dome or exploding it. And so perhaps they do not mean much of anything in themselves. There's no Lovecraft meaning or significance to it, no obvious Shadow World meaning. The multicolored barrier comes from the colors of the four spells. It seems to be a cool thing without much subtext to it. But maybe there's some higher concept in it if you look at it in science terms. It's turning the crystal dome into a magical analog, maybe, of those novelty plasma dome balls that were popular a few decades ago, where you have a glass globe filled with noble gases and there's a high voltage electrode in the center. So the interior of the globe is arcing colored plasma filaments to the sphere boundary. Except instead of plasma voltage, you have this elemental energy. And instead of streaming arcs, it is reflected light flashes, which would be a cool parallel, at least. Instead of a physical barrier, it's a light barrier, like some kind of nullifying interference effect. Like if you formed a magnetic containment field that bounces off electromagnetic matter, as they do with, with plasma and fusion reactors or the vacuum chambers of atomic clocks. Or like a magical Faraday cage, which blocks electromagnetic waves between the interior and exterior, with the waves inducing negating electric fields. Or the multicolored barrier from the shield spells is shifting to reflect all the wavelengths, that is colors, coming from the bright light. Sort of like a Gauss's Law of Magic, with the charges reorienting inside an abstract sphere and then being neutral outside of the sphere. Or maybe like how electrons filling up atomic orbitals mask the positive charge of the nucleus, making the atom neutral on the outside. Where light is emitted in a sudden pulse, essentially, when the electron falls down in energy level, becoming more tightly bound. Which could be an interesting metaphor, if we imagine the crystal dome is powered by the negative essence of the unlife, which wants to absorb and consume all the positive essence, self-annihilating. The barrier spells inside the dome combine in any case, so the range of the dome is truncated. So there's a flash of light whenever the dome absorbs. Weird as it might seem, it sounds like the light pulse is the signal of the power absorb itself, so that if we see the light is contained in the barrier, there's no power drain. It's a bright flash if it's a spell or channel, otherwise dim multicolored pulses. When the energy barrier is around the dome, the bright flashes emanate, but the light bounces back into the dome. If you want to be anal about it, it's kind of hard to imagine what that would actually look like. It would only be the transmitted light you see, and light moves at the speed of light. It's essentially instantaneous from our point of view. If you can see the flash, you see the flash, right? So maybe you see some of the dome's flash, and there's some pattern formed in the multicolored barrier and then a reflection from that barrier is partly reflected off the crystal surface of the dome. It isn't clear if it's a spherical flash or a beam out of the dome facets. It sounds like the sphere is between you and the crystal dome. If you were inside it, you ought to still get drained. You might imagine a sustained rather than brief beam, but with the beam bouncing off the barrier, reflected back into the crystal, and so you're seeing the beam being reflected because some of that beam is being scattered off the air. In fact, the fog would be doing that, probably, because fog is swirling around the dome. Imagine lasers into the club. You might imagine the fog giving away light directionality patterns even if it is not a beam. Or maybe this is looking at it wrong. The light is a symptom of something else. 
an invisible signal that is moving much slower than the speed of light. And this is what is actually getting reflected by the barrier. It would look like the light is bouncing back, essentially an optical illusion. So you might imagine this signal is the dark essence of the unlife, which is invisible in itself, except as a void in the background essence, and it's light essence giving off the light, which of course may be totally overthinking it. But regardless, I remind you that hooded figures spawn in a brilliant flash of light, though I do not know if this ever blocked them from spawning. But it suggests power given physical form is tied to the flashes of light and power absorbing of the dome, which, unless actively fed with power, does not overheat and explode on its own. The faint gray barrier versus shimmering multicolored barrier is remarkable in an optic sense of crystal prism splitting light, because, as I said, blending multicolored light is gray, so here the colors become spread out somewhat. It is suggesting some self-conscious awareness of the actual nature of gray light, which could boost how I interpreted the grayness of the Mickleian Cavern, where, you know, a grainy montage of colors is the very beginning of the purgatory messaging when your body decays. But anyway, 1002 vibration chant also has its own special messaging on the dome. Most spells absorb silently. 1002 makes the dome vibrate slightly, but not much happens with it. I suspect there may have been more to it than that originally. It's reminiscent of Black Swan Castle, where you have a crystal dome encasing a blue sphere, and you need to shatter the crystal dome with vibrations. If a bard does it, it will kill everyone in the room, but you can do it with a tuning fork quest object. Black Swan Castle dates back to summer 1992, so it is reasonable to directly compare them. Similar to how we can compare the monastery door to the counterweighted paddle wheel, dam, stream, and elevator on Melkler's Reach, being near contemporaries of each other. There is, at the least, a hint of recognition here for the idea that crystal vibrates at a resonant frequency, which helps justify what I did earlier, reading into the acoustics of the Dark Grotto. It might be that the dome is never turned off, it only gets blocked, and 704 phase is just inherently deadly. Ricarth told me he vaguely recalls Thalior successfully phasing into the crystal dome object, but getting killed and then decaying inside it with the item droppage. Something worth considering, though, is what I've said before about the implicit enclosure of the Broken Land. I had suggested the possibility of a force field on some large scale tied to the dome. That call lightning not working originally might mean there's an energy barrier, rather than implying it is all underground, like the peaks of Thok. Given what the dome puzzle actually does, that is no longer an idle speculation, though it would be letting meteors in if those really are meteors. Their high frequency would maybe be some time warp symptom, similar to the moon altar on top of Melgren's Reach. The Crone relationship remains ambiguous. Moon Beast Micklean and Moon Milk McGrew Fungal Calcite Powder, notwithstanding. Supposing this were all a huge impact basin, or one of numerous Cenote sinkholes along an impact ring, it is worth noting again that the 1992 Master Atlas described the Eastern Hemisphere of Colthea in terms of the negative universe of the unlife, behind the Wall of Darkness. The Wall of Darkness is an interface between this world and with the negative universe of the unlife. So the Eastern Hemisphere is a negative world, not just separated by an energy barrier. And when the Lords of Orhan arrived in this dimension, there was a tiny black hole that impacted the Eastern Hemisphere and came out the opposite side in the continent of Thule, forming the towering pillar of the gods out of volcanic crystal, which has distortions around it causing shifts in space and time. So if this place is in the Eastern Hemisphere involving that impact, or a parallel dimension impact of the comet Sakane, there could be an esoteric parallel of light gods and dark gods in major impact events. In the later Shadow World books, the Eastern Hemisphere has surviving followers of Empress Kadena, but that detail was seemingly not established yet when the Broken Land was created. At one time, I thought the Pillar of the God Spire and Thule might be subtly relevant to the Broken Land because our era glossary did not include the two words for pillar and god, Luar and Kai. 
I ruled this out as a coincidence because the 1990 glossary omitted them. All the words were included in the 1992 and onward glossaries. It must have been an oversight because the Luarkatai term was in the 1989 Master Atlas. But given the conspicuously non-spinning globe in Uthex's abode, the relevance of the Eastern Hemisphere still has to be taken seriously. The pillar of the gods' formation in the West caused material to get towed into orbit, the most fell back down leading to a large volume of rare elements on the surface of Thule from falling debris, and volcanism is still unusually widespread in Thule because of it. The surrounding land is known as the Ring of Thule, and the northwest side of the ring is arid desert. These details altogether sound quite similar to the conditions we see in the broken land, and if those falling rocks really are meteors instead of cracking boulders, it could have something to do with ejected material in orbit may be falling back down in relatively high frequency, notwithstanding the questioning I did for its localization, since the crystal forest is not damaged or buried by falling rocks. This isn't really something we can settle with the available information, but that variation on impact theory would be an intriguing option for tying it all together. There is really no confidence for what the missing parts of the dome puzzle might have done, but what should it have done based on the last six hours of interpretation and theory building. If my through the gates of the silver key subtext theory is correct, then I would guess that correctly manipulating the crystal dome should parallel the portal to the broken land in some way because of the quasi-sphere in that story. It should perhaps transport you somewhere else, maybe to that cryptic tower, or otherwise take you out of existence in some way because the rune portal is actually making you non-existent in the reality of Kothea. You actually suddenly fade away when you use the Dark Shrine portal. It's a similar kind of effect, not walking through an archway. In Through the Gates of the Silver Key, Randolph Carter goes through the ultimate gateway formed by the Quasi-Sphere, and as a result of doing this, ends up in a discorporated state where he has no physical body. It would be really cool if the Crystal Dome had done something similar. Not just parallel to this, but to Gemstone's death mechanics, where you decay, become spirit, and go to some other plane of existence, and then come back and reincarnate. And you have to wonder why the Monastery Sewer would be tied to some other tower location in its scripting. Like if you could go down there in a special status condition, whereas you cannot go down there physically. Maybe the monks, in their meditation, were able to go under the monastery via their own projections, which might have something to do with the struggle Kaigar was talking about in his interview, because it isn't obvious how the monks were struggling for centuries in the mountain, unless they had to deal with the hooded figures in this other way, because the rune portal was sealed off when it was found in 1992. It would be a waste to use multiple astral projecting references without actually doing it. But that's pure speculation, inference from the Lovecraft subtext. It's just weird to not have the dome incarnating physical forms out of energy, because that was the fundamental premise of the Uthex story. So I think what's missing from the puzzle was probably central to the point of the broken land, since everything about the place is pointing toward the dome being able to do that. It doesn't really even make sense for the dome to not do it. It has to be made relevant to Uthex's work. But who knows? So a bunch of this is probably outside the scope of what the author actually considered. But there is enough there that we can be confident that internal logic for physical processes like geology, sound, and light does apply. The deep uncertainty is how far that logic is meant to hold up. And as always, it comes down to guessing the premises, where hopefully the intended premises are the ones that most effortlessly and immediately explain the most details. But in the worst case scenario, I found some diabolically clever ways of being completely wrong. That, in a nutshell, is the Broken Lands. All I have to say about that for now. This is a very complicated case. It has a lot of ins, a lot of outs, a lot of what have you, a lot of them. Um, strands to keep in my head man but i can tell you one thing they don't make them like they used to i uh oh thanks ray look the moral of the story is that if someone asks you if you're a god you say yes 
Yes, Empress Kadina, or Gianna, Mother of Darkness, whatever your name is, please make me into a dark god or dreadful demon lord, or at least some other eldritch abomination, because it's way better than the Gates of Oblivion. But look, I have no way of telling you what the pure metaphysical truth of the authorial intent is with the Broken Land. Some of these possibilities I've worked out will be coincidences or not mutually consistent. But I think I've gotten us a whole lot closer to what is really going on with the place. I suspect the missing dome puzzle messaging would have answered some questions. The idea of an allegorical interpretation or layer of hidden meaning is that there is a recognizable parallel to some other idea and that this is not just a loose source of inspiration where, yeah, it used a thing, but it doesn't mean much. But instead, that recognizing this parallel or system of references actually informs the meaning of what was created, which raises the question of whether these things, assuming they are really there, were actually ever supposed to be recognized by the players, as opposed to just being some kind of insider knowledge, something only a few old GMs were supposed to know, which may distort how it's supposed to be read. It might be that the Shadow World and Rollmaster stuff was the main thing the players were supposed to figure out, while this other stuff with Lovecraft and historical death religions and esotericism and so on had no reasonable explanation of ever being recognized by the readers. In other words, Gemstone having its own hidden arcane mysteries, esoteric knowledge that only the initiated would be told. But who knows? If I'm right, I cracked it anyway. Otherwise, I'm being the ancient aliens guy. So you have all my standard disclaimers about how I'm trying to speculate and reconstruct the original concepts of things. I'm willing to temporarily risk wrong explanations in the pursuit of unearthing the right explanations. I'm not giving word of God written on stone tablets. This is how it is. Absolute authority stuff. Whether or not this dead gods of the underworld theme is implying that the mountains in the broken land are literally underground like the peaks of Throck or if it's just a symbolic underworld to, say, play into Dante, I believe the more fundamental intent is a symbolic relationship with the old death mechanics, which is only partly set within the context of Shadow World. I think the geology of the Broken Land and the mammal bones are really fatal for the interpretation of the Broken Land being under the surface of Caron. And without having to be on Caron, there's really almost no reason to motivate the Broken Land being underground at all. It may well be a parallel dimension which had a huge impact event, and then using this as an allegory for Dante's Purgatory, because we had the same premise in the graveyard where Satan was tied into Lovecraft's Nyarlathotep, as Nyarlathotep is likened to a fallen archangel in the Dream Quest falling end scene. And then the Broken Land is very literal, along with the boulder cleaving. Whatever this Caron association really means, I think it's supposed to be a dark mirror of the Gates of Oblivion being on Orhan, and that what Uthex was doing was being twisted into depraved forms of immortal unliving by forces of the unlife, and that this may relate to the weird lore about Kadena's surviving followers fashioning great demons, which follows in a straightforward way from the logic of the situation. If the Broken Land is another plane of existence, the monsters there should implicitly ipso facto be extraplanar entities. So the hypothesis that the non-demon extraplaners from Rollmaster are their basis creatures is a fair speculation. Though as I've mentioned, the extraplanar game mechanic was much later. Only the Keen Lin were made extraplanar. Since there are forces of the unlife involved, they would logically twist this work toward the demonic, and it follows naturally from this that the Dark Gods originated in the Lords of Essence but there's some other stuff involved that is not related to ice sources. And there are, it seems to me, some much deeper things going on with it, much more concept behind it all, if you can just manage to identify the premises for it. Thank you for watching my historical exploration series on the Broken Land. Hopefully you have learned something worth knowing, because knowledge is good. Hey guys, if you want to see more of my fantabulous videos, be sure to click one of these links. But I warn you, it will put you at serious, serious risk of becoming a huge nerd.
that are training that atomic wedgie seaman to brace yourselves. I mean, I'm assuming. Like, I can be bothered to learn anything about the PSM review. Don't be a square. <laughs>